mean that we will have three presentations looking into the uh, Russia's legitimation of war and, and justification of its uh, aggression against Ukraine. My name is Katri Pynäniemi. I work at the National Defense University and University of Helsinki as a associ associate professor on Russian security studies. And it's my pleasure to moderate this, this panel today. We will, as I mentioned, three presentations each have uh, 30 minutes and um, you can either use the whole time or then spare some time for short questions. And then in the very end we will have a half, around half an hour for, for joint discussion. And uh, okay, let's start with Iva um, Berzina from National Defense Academy of Latvia. Uh, talking on equalization of nationalism and Nazism in Russian strategic narratives. Floor is for yours. Thank you so much for coming. Shall I sit or stand? You can choose. Okay. Well, so, yeah, so I will stand maybe, yeah. So, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for a kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, my ideas uh, here. It's, it is indeed an honor to be here and, uh, uh, and uh, to share my ideas. And before I start, I must say that uh, I want to emphasize that I'm in the very initial uh, stage of my uh, research and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and why it's important to say this because the topic is very broad, complex and also sensitive as we discussed uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, colleagues. Nevertheless, uh, I have uh, some ideas formul uh, being formulated. And also I'm, uh, I'm about to prepare this as an academic uh, paper, so my approach will be more like uh, like uh, academic. Nevertheless, why uh, why uh, uh, why I, I, I started to uh, investigate this theme because I'm from Latvia and uh, we uh, as uh, in Latvia we have been used for decades being accused by Russia uh, that our country uh, there is a reverse of neo-Nazism in our country. We are get used with that. But in the last, especially in the context of Russo-Ukrainian war from 2002, more and more I see in the discourse that the concept of nationalism also comes up. And that makes it more complex and, and more complicated. That's why I wanted to uh, dig deeper and take a look how do they... Um, um, how do they interpret it? Uh, uh, how do nationalism co comes in into this uh, uh, rhetoric? Uh, uh, so uh, basically, I will I try to answer. I have posed two research questions: uh, how Russia relates the concepts of nationalism and Nazism in its strategic narratives, especially about ex-Soviet uh, countries. Uh, and the second question, how uh, the strategic uh, narratives of nationalism and Nazism are being used to justify military aggression of, uh, against neighboring uh, countries. And uh, as my theoretical approach, I decided to uh, take a look uh, at this issue from a post-colonial perspective because uh, the, uh, to understand uh, Russia's strategic narratives, actually it requires uh, at least to take a look back into the history for at least 200 centuries ago. It's also a very vast topic uh, geographically and in terms of uh, cultural uh, diversity, but, 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 but pretty much uh, uh, what we see in those um, Russia's narratives, it relates back to uh, colonial uh, history and so this post-colonial lens to a large extent uh, helps uh, uh, helps uh, to gain better understanding. And second, uh, second uh, leg of my theoretical framework of course is the concept of uh, nationalism which uh, indeed to, uh, to, to make sense of what Russians are, Russian officials are 
uh, saying in the uh, rhetoric, it, it is indeed important to understand what do we understand by a nationalism. And of course, it's, it's a very complicated and contested concept itself. But for the purpose of my paper, I have defined it as a political idea that a nation as a distinct social group aims for political sovereignty. And, uh, and, and already from here we see the complexity of the concept because from, on the one hand, uh, this way nationalism is a threat to empire, but on the other hand, as we will see in the way how Russia exploits this concept, it, it, it paradoxically nationalism itself may be imperial. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and this is, I think, uh, what uh, the empirical data will lead me. And, uh, and the second important point also is that uh, national <coughs> awakening or development of nationalism, that initially it is closely related with the development of democracy, because in 19th century, uh, and also, uh, which is very important in the case of the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, national uh, nationalism was uh, related with national and democratic uh, movements, and I think this is very important to emphasize, especially in today's context, because if we uh, 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 there are some voices uh, uh, predicting that uh, uh, one of the possible consequences of uh, a Russo-Ukraine war will be possible disintegration of Russia, and I think uh, keeping in mind that uh, that its national and democratic movements, it, it, it's 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 a, it's an important. Uh, argument to, to say why it's, this prediction is a bit problematic, to put it mildly. But at the same time, nationalism, uh, as, as, as the history shows us, nationalism takes different forms. It may be, it, it, it may, it may be, uh, 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 it, it, it may be, um, it may be democratic uh, and also, but it may take extreme forms. And of course, history has showed us that uh, it may grow to Nazism as an extreme form of uh, uh, nationalism, as the ideology of uh, Nazi German nationalist socialist uh, political uh, party. And, and largely because of this historical experience in the Western academic and political discourse, there is this. Uh, uh, this, this, this problematic aspect of nationalism is present, and I think uh, Russia largely exploits these ideas by equalizing uh, nationalism uh, and, uh, and, 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 and nazism. And uh, from, a, uh, from a theoretical uh, point of view also, uh, in, when we uh, to, uh, to look uh, at the uh, research questions from the theories of nationalism, I wanted to point out that the, uh, at the uh, concept developed by Brubaker in 1994, uh, article about the uh, about the built-in tensions between Russia and the neighboring countries, because this colonial experience largely uh, uh, changed demographic uh, uh, ethnic structures of countries, and Latvia and Estonia are the uh, most uh, obvious example, but it relates also to other countries once being part of the Soviet Union. And, and, and his, uh, his uh, paper pretty much explains that this is rather that this post-colonial context puts a rather complicated uh, complicated context uh, between uh, uh, between uh, 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 between uh, the so-called titular nations uh, and national minorities because they this this is this is a triangle because they those uh, uh, Russian speaking ethnical minorities are largely they have this external uh, national homeland so this uh, creates very specific uh, specific uh, context uh, as a method, uh, uh, as a method, I have started and, and I will will use it further. Uh, so it will be the thematic analysis, and I will focus on uh, Russian official discourse. So I will use uh, uh, public announcements and speeches of uh, Russian officials, uh, strategic documents. Um, uh, and, and, and other publicly available uh, sources. And of course, uh, I, I, I will take a period from 2014 when uh, Russia-Ukraine war actually started till 
till uh, till 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 current uh, days. Uh, still, as I said, I'm in the very beginning of the process, although some of the themes I have uh, sketched and I will uh, share with you uh, what we see in in uh, Russian uh, discourse. But before I start, I would like to give you some quotes from the paper, which actually was written in 1997 by Zatulin and Migrian. And, and why I wanted to show you those quotes, because to my mind, they pretty much explain this logic of empire building or rebuilding. And what they have written in this paper is that, uh, that, um, uh, that to their understanding, the only way for Russia to stay in the long term is that, uh, that it needs to be a, a center of gravity for the, uh, in the post-Soviet uh, post space. And if they will not exert influence in the neighboring countries, then according to their perspective, uh, the West, again, the West will tear apart not only former republics of the Soviet Union, but also Russia itself. Because as you know, it is constituted from uh, many federal subjects, uh, which have, uh, and, and, and many of them has um, some uh, statehood, uh, statehood uh, elements. Uh, so, so what they wrote in that paper that uh, for for Russia to sustain, uh, so it needs to involve in the processes of state building in the former republics of uh, the Soviet uh, of the Soviet Union. So, so it was clearly uh, formulated, and there are two more uh, two more uh, uh, thoughts that are important in the context of uh, the use of uh, in the interpretation of nationalism, and one is that. Uh, 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 while um, reflecting on possible integration of Russia, so they consider the uh, European integration model uh, for Russia, and they argued that it's not uh, not uh, relevant for Russia. But then they again they pointed out to this uh, uh, Russian uh, Russian speaking diaspora outside Russia's borders as a potential for for integration. And interestingly enough, uh, at this time, uh, so they also uh, continue to, uh, 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 to to elaborate this idea. At, at that time, uh, the still uh, the war in, wars in Chechnya were were still going on, and 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 in their idea, in case that uh, Chechnya would succeed uh, to to success from uh, Russia, so. In their understanding, this would uh, put the principle of national self-determination as a priority over the principle of uh, of uh, of, uh, of um, territorial um, uh, territorial uh, 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 and that's so that you cannot uh, uh, cannot. Uh, uh, Change territorial boundaries, and and so they thought that this will this will be like a, a case that will uh, give a, a possibility uh, to um, to use this principle of national self the self determination to to use it for redistributing uh, redistributing territorial boundaries in the in the former Soviet uh, Soviet Union. So, so this is just to illustrate this uh, mindset. Um, yeah, and uh, before uh, before I will uh, I will outline several of the themes that come up in the context of uh, this uh, nationalism uh, discourse. Uh, to uh, also to emphasis from national uh, from for, for, for about nationalism in Russian foreign policy and in domestic policy, and when it comes to foreign policy, an interesting aspect is that if you take a look at the concept of uh, Russian foreign policy, there is a section on international cooperation and human rights, and what you can see in this uh, part that human rights are largely. It, there is lot of emphasis in understanding of the human rights that it is the protection of uh, Russian compatriots abroad, and it's about uh, and it's lots of emphasis on the dissemination of the Russian uh, language and uh, and Russian uh, Russian uh, culture, uh, and also it refers to to some pan-Slavic uh, pan-Slavic ideas, and also in the same uh, text you can see that also it's. Uh, 
it's a, it's a opposition to manifestations of neo-Nazism and aggressive uh, nationalism. Um, so it, in, in, in this um, way. And when you come to uh, nationalism in domestic policies, then you can see that, um, uh, it, so again, a large, uh, large theme to, 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 to talk to is about the idea of what Russian nation is. And then there is this debate of, uh, ling uh, this linguistic debate about distinction between Russian as uh, uh, civic identity and Russian as ethnic identity, uh, but so uh, in 2018 uh, they uh, they 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 uh, uh, defined the strategy of the state national policy of the Russian Federation, which defines that Russian nation <laughs> is civic nation, but at the same time it is uh, it, it emphasizes the dominate dominance of the Russian uh, of the Russian uh, culture uh, and also I internally internally uh, it, it emphasizes the need to uh, to fight with nationalism as a form of extremism but now so uh, some of the themes that i so far was able to uh, identify in 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 in, in some of uh, as my like preliminary findings so to speak so first theme is the dual use of the principle of national self determination so in case if it serves uh, if it suits uh, Russia's strategic interests, then they refer to the principle of uh, national self-determination. De but at the same time, uh, at the same time, it is being denied if uh, if it uh, if it is uh, against Russia's uh, interests. Because uh, yeah, on the one hand, uh, 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 on the one uh, hand, uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, could you refer to this uh, national self-determination, but at the same time, in the same speech, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin warns against the parade of sovereignties taking place from 1988 till 1991. Uh, the second uh, theme uh, also is that nationalism in the post-Soviet space is largely a result of Bolshevik and Soviet national policies, so and, and and this has again deeper implications uh, if it's formulated uh, this way. So it it, it denies uh, it denies uh, national uh, awakening of uh, smaller nations per se. I would say, and also uh, uh, and also I think it has also implication. Well, so if if it, if it was artificial construct of uh, of Bolshevik and Soviet national policies, so kind of. Uh, it gives us, uh, uh, it frees our hands, we can also deconstruct it. So, so this really neglects uh, national identities of smaller uh, nations. The third theme is, of course, it, 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 it again, it puts it in, into the a bigger scheme that uh, nationalism of smaller nations is anti-Russia project of the West. So it puts it into uh, that uh, context. Uh, which, which again, uh, uh, which again diminishes the importance of smaller nations because first of all we either are construct of Soviet uh, Bolshevik uh, uh, policies or we are used by, by by the West, but it simply degrades the very idea that smaller nations can have their own national identities and their own statehood and 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 and, 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 and willingness. Uh, the fourth theme, uh, I think this is, uh, but again, yeah, this is here, I, I really have to emphasize that this is what the Russian, of, which, which, which is said by Russians, and, uh, and uh, that uh, basically they describe Ukrainian armed forces as nationalists to, uh, very often and, and often times. And, and also, and, and adding to this, uh, that Ukraine, Ukraine armed forces as nationalists are destroying their own people, uh, which is, to put it mildly, it's, 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 it's turning the concept of nationalism upside down, not to say that it's absurd, actually, uh, because uh, nationalism aims for the development of uh, and longevity of a, of a nation, but it's really cruel uh, and, and really absurd way to put it. 
The fifth theme is that uh, also this relates, uh, relates to this domestic uh, to, to this domestic policy and and this uh, this uh, possible scenario of uh, Russia's disintegration. And this is uh, strictly and clearly defined that national nationalism within Russia is also an internal threat for Russia. And, uh, and I think this goes hand in hand with suppression of civil society and also any possibility for uh, democratic expressions of Russian society to uh, not to allow uh, recurrence of the parade of sovereignties of the kind that was uh, taking place in 1988 and 1991. And uh, finally, uh, which actually relates to this theme, that nationalism, uh, not only Nazism or reverse of Nazism or neo-Nazism, but also nationalism, is the basis for the intervention in in in, in other countries. And uh, as you can uh, as you can see in the, some of those Putin's quotes, so that this nationalism of theirs is something that we should uh, react to and this plague, plague of uh, nationalism uh, we couldn't ignore it so we had to involve and and from this and this is something i want to develop further because my hypothesis would be that attributing nationalism to some country is might be serve as an indication that there are some risks and uh, tensions uh, with uh, uh, with uh, russia uh, so uh, what are my preliminary conclusions so far? So that the, to, to answer the first question is pretty easy. So the concepts of nationalism and Nazism are being used almost as interchangeable in Russian official rhetoric. Of course, if I will work out this in more detail, there will be it, it, it will be specified that it will be aggressive nationalism or extremist nationalism, whatever, but you can find many places that this is just used as, as being, being, uh, being the same. And interestingly enough that Russia, of course, in this way Russia is hostile towards national identities of smaller neighboring countries, but as its hostility and, and as its uh, justification of aggression is based on the needs to protect the Russian a speaking population or the so-called Russian compatriots abroad. So actually, we may sp we we may speak about the fact that de facto it is pursuing imperial nationalism, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, which was uh, nicely formulated in by Yegor Gaidar in 2006, uh, thinks that it is a post-imperial syndrome as radical uh, nationalism. And uh, in this aspect, I think, uh, when we look at this colonial aspect, so uh, Russian compatriots uh, abroad largely is a post-colonial ethnic minority, because this is uh, because uh, Soviet occupation really changed ethnic uh, structures, but this uh, ethnic minority is being instrumental instrumentalized by Russia for empire building. And also this uh, uh, Russian view on uh, nationalism, it has both outward and inward implications as it is being used for the justification of aggression against neighboring countries and also suppression of civil society uh, domestically. And I will stop here and thank you. I will thank you very much for an attention. Excellent, thank you. Would there be any quick questions at this point? How quick? Huh? How quick? <laughs> well, we have time, so please okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. It has been completely different from what I do in my daily life, so this was very illuminating. But I would like to ask you to speculate. If Russia, and it's not going to happen, but I still speculate, if Russia decides to sort of right, we'll get rid of the idea of empire. Or what would it take for Russia to get rid of the idea of empire? <clears throat> I think it's a centuries long process to actually take that out of the country. Yeah, uh, uh, I will reflect. Uh, this Zatulin and Migrayan uh, paper that I quoted, 
and they uh, and and their use is that well that Russia needs to exert influence to 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 to, to sustain and they use it as axiom and I thought by myself why. Why is such an oxy? Why Russia can't exist like a normal country? And then I, 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 my answer is, and, and I think it relates to your question, that it is, this, uh, it is about the value system and it's about autocracy and democracy. Uh, and I think uh, uh, to uh, get, so, so to answer your question, to get rid of uh, imperialism, the only way might be uh, democratize. But again, uh, but but uh, and it's still uh, it's still a question if 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 it would uh, if it would uh, help. But my answer is really that it wants to it, it, to to be uh, to function as an autocratic state. So that's why they are scared of the West, uh, and I think uh, and and and, they, and 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 to be able to resist the West, they need to have this. Uh, uh, larger being geopolitically more strong, and that's why they need uh, similar autocratic states like Belarus and, 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 and Ukraine, I think is also crucial from this uh, geopolitical uh, aspect. Uh, so, uh, democratization, uh, 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 yeah, and, and also this uh, issue of color revolutions that came up in the first panel, I think it also fits, uh, fits uh, here. Yeah, I hope it answers, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That was really interesting and very good start for, for our panel. And we continue discussion uh, in, after we heard everybody else's. So next one is Marcia Simina. Uh, very glad to see you here. And you continue on this same topic, uh, focusing on denazification. And maybe, sh shall we? Put away this next one. Yes, and that's yes, the sorry, and that's yes, this <laughs> yes. little accident thanks to the Finnish eyes. So I couldn't prepare uh, some slides, or I tried, but with one hand didn't really. The result wasn't very good. So I'll try to keep the presentation though um, as engaging as possible. Um, so great, thank you Katri for the introduction, thanks to Eva also for the like, brilliant presentation and I'm glad to see the others were interested in the same topic as, as I was. Um, and of course, looking at the, after the, the start of the war, there are many questions that we all have. This, this war has raised many, many. Um, but it was one in particular that caught my attention and it was really why uh, Putin, promised, and I'm quoting, that Russian forces will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. And similarly, then the Ministry of Defense, the Shoigo, echoed these words by saying that the fight against any manifestation of Nazism must be uncompromising and comprehensive. So, uh, what I'm looking now in my presentation is really to unpack the definition of denazification according to the Kremlin. And especially how and why the fight against Nazism plays such a central role in the war in Ukraine. Um, there are different definitions that I've been, that I've seen and I read since the beginning of the war. Um, especially the part of the information war launched by the Kremlin um, started in, uh, with Maidan after 2014 with some neo-Nazi so-called groups in, in Maidan. And then later you can see that Russia has, uh, the Kremlin has associated some concept of Nazism more closer to define in a way the Ukrainian authorities. So that was really something that caught my attention and I wanted to dig deeper so I started reading the Russian-based uh, scholars. So my research is based on the academia to see how the definition of Nazism has evolved. And I looked especially three phases, which was from 1991, so from the collapse of the Soviet Union to 2014, the annexation of Crimea, and then the second phase, 2014 until 2000. 
2022, so the beginning of the war, and then after 2022, to see how has been evolved and consolidated in the propaganda. Now, the word propaganda is also interesting. I think that also during my presentation, I will highlight that one of the key questions is whether this is still propaganda or whether propaganda has become a reality through the ideology. So we see how this has evolved as a concept. What, what I mean by deeper than propaganda, it means to what extent has been really reached deep roots in not only throughout the Russian society, but also in the way they're, they're seeing the world through the, from the Kremlin perspective. Um, so that's why I claim that Nazism has been consolidated as part of the Kremlin ideology. Now, I, find, I found four definitions of Nazism, and I will guide you through them in my presentation. And I divided my presentation in four sections. The first section is how the past is still influencing the present. The second one is the creation of the enemy. The third one is the perception of threats, according to the Kremlin. And the fourth one is how this ideology has been linked to the military doctrine. So I start with the first section which is how the past is still influencing the present. And I argue that we need to go back at least to the Second World War. So that was my starting point, looking at the sources. And I, so looking at the history, there's one thing is clear that the Second World War is still dividing contemporary Russian thoughts. And it is, from the Kremlin perspective, there are two main uh, ways how the legacy of the Second World War impact the current thinking. The first one is the uh, falsification of facts. It's the uh, distortion of the historical legacy. Uh, so, for example, the Kremlin claims that um, the USSR played a crucial role in uh, fighting Nazi Germany it was the main victor. Uh, but in the Western history books, so in the Western perception, this role is marginalized or diminished. It's more about how the war was won by the US, by the UK, um, and the Kremlin claims this is not fair because some of the Western allies were not only sympathetic to Hitler, some of them were even allies. Um, so, uh, why the role of the Soviet Union has been so marginalized? So this is one. The second one, it's, uh, which I find very interesting also because I have, a, I have a background in history, and so it's how the war is remembered. And this is so controversial still now. And by reading the sources, I think I, what my understanding is that the Kremlin believes that uh, in, since the dissolution of the Soviet Union and in Ukraine after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, it is the Eastern European countries, like Poland, the Baltic States, and what I mentioned Ukraine after 2014, they are breaking away for the way how the Second World War is celebrated. It's worth mentioning that the Second World War in Russia is not called only Second World War, but it's a great patriotic war. And this is per se something that they're very proud of as a, because not only fought Nazi Germany, but brought, brought the USSR arguably in a, in a leading role in the global politics. So from the Kremlin, as they've seen particularly, I would say offensive or concerning, some attempts to um, criticize the USSR for nothing, nothing short than starting the Second World War with the Rimitrop Molotov Pact, or um, uh, denouncing, this is Eastern European countries, uh, denouncing the crimes of, of Stalinism, almost comparing, or comparing Stalinism with Nazism. And then also like more concretely, the change in the Remembrance Day 
uh, how they celebrate it, even the dates themselves. So this has been taken already as a sign, as a warning sign by the Kremlin that uh, the change of how the war is remembered. It's uh, a sign of something else, which is a political stance. Not only, so it's history that has been manipulated, has been used uh, to project uh, power. But this is nothing new, so it's nothing. There have been controversies over history in other parts of the world, and that may continue. Now, looking at Ukraine, of course, the case is much more complex, uh, given the tragic history of the country during the Second World War. So many of the articles I was reading, they are referring to um, a alleged split in the country, so in Ukraine, from west to east, broadly speaking. So in the east, um, there was a Red Army, and interestingly, some of the positions uh, in the Second World War, they, used, they were used in the um, war in Donbass, so still the same lines, more or less the same uh, defensive positions. And then the west of the countries, uh, um, they've been created, many of you have heard of them, uh, they've been founded in the 1920s, and there is the organization of uh, Ukrainian nationalists, the OUN, um, the acronym, and the militant faction, which is the um, Ukrainian insurgent army, the UPA. Um, many of you may have heard the name Bandera, which is one, was one of the leaders of these organizations, uh, and that was most in the west of the country. And they um, are accused by the Kremlin to be collaborators, uh, seen largely as pro-fascist and collaborator with the Nazi regimes. So the legacy of the Second World War uh, in Ukraine, as seen by Russian sources, is still very <coughs> controversial. And there have been interesting studies to see how actually Ukrainians themselves see the Second World War. And this may change for uh, political reasons, uh, so it depends if you are more leaning to the right wing or, or left wing, or the age also, it's another factor in how this, the war is perceived in Ukraine. There have been interesting studies, but I don't, I don't want to go into that now. So just to go back to, um, to, the hour, um, just to, to our topic. Um, so Russia, it's especially concerned about the celebration of these two groups that I just mentioned before. So the Ukrainian nationalist, um, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists uh, and the UPA, which is the, the military factions. And especially in Ukraine, some of those, um, some of the monuments that were dedicated to the Second World War, um, or to the Great Patriotic War, they have been replaced uh, by others, or like statues of Bandera or others, uh, um, portraying um, allegedly these, these groups. And that has been maybe the beginning of of why Russia has seen the problematic the way that is the change in how Ukraine has been remembering the war. Um, and then they say the historical revisionism has, take, has taken a negative trajectory. So that's what Kremlin sources have been, have been mentioning. And is, it reflects a broader political stance that the Kremlin finds offensive. Um, why especially, why they so, I had to dig deeper and read through the sources, what do they mean by that? And then I see, so it, it's an, uh, unacceptable, especially because it under, undermines the sacrifice of the Soviet people in the liberation of Europe from Nazi Germany. Um, the other papers also claim that the Kremlin sees that as a, as a betrayal. So, quoting again, quoting Russian sources. So in other words, according to the Kremlin, that if you don't see the sacrifices that the Soviet Union, the, so the Red Army, has made in the Second World War, then you don't appreciate the value, and therefore you must be against it. And there we have the first definition. If you're anti-Soviet, you must be a Nazi. Then moving on to the second definition and coming closer to the, um, to the present days, Another turning point was, again, identified by um, the Kremlin, in the Kremlin propaganda. Another turning point was 2015, when President Poroshenko signed a package of laws 
we call the decommunalization, communization laws, and included different uh, aspects, including the um, what the Kremlin claims the rehabilitation of the nationalist movement. So the the UPA and the organization of Ukrainian nationalists have been rehabilitated. And it's um, but the part of the law, at least back in 2015, and I'm not sure now what now has changed, but there was a there was also a mention that disputing their existence and their role as heroes could be criminalized. So that's uh, that's well getting closer to the second definition that I found of Nazism, according to the Kremlin, which is so if you are a Russophobe, so anything that leads against the Russian identity and language and laws and history also historical legacy, then you're a Nazi. So that's the second definition. Now, um, again, moving closer then to the third section that I mentioned at the beginning, the idea of the enemy. So now, looking at so far, I said, of course, it's very worrying, very concerning, very bleak outlook, but there is nothing that exceptional almost. So it is quite natural that after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, you have different ways, different historical narratives, looking back at the facts. Uh, the historical facts that happened. This, they are disputed also in other parts of the world. What make it special uh, combustible mix in, uh, in the relations between Russia and Ukraine? And it's very interesting what Tieva highlighted. So the idea that there was imperialism, that in my presentation, the guy used a different word, which is unity. But I think we use the same source, which is the, the essay written by Putin in 2021 on the unity of the Russian and Ukrainian people, which is now is largely seen as a prelude to, to the war. So the unity then is that um, when reading the essay, you understand that by unity it means the common uh, spiritual and physical space shared by Ukrainians and Russians. Uh, um, and now, the, so the enemy is whoever wants to break that unity. So any efforts to break away, then you're an enemy. Which now we see a more concerning narrative, if you want to analyze it as, as an external observer. So any attempt to create a national identity, to break away from the past, from a Soviet legacy, he's seen as an attempt to break that unity. And now we have the third definition of Nazism, which is nationalism, to connect with the Eva's presentation. Um, and then, so linked to the idea of the enemy, it's the idea of threat. And the threat it's also something that I found very interesting reading papers. So this is Jeffrey Michaels. So um, in uh, in the in one issue of the um, Journal of Slavic Military Studies before the war, and very interesting. He pointed that the Second World War is still very vivid in the Kremlin, and especially in Vladimir Putin. What about the Second World War was so surprising is the Barbarossa operation. And Jeffrey Michaels calls it a Barbarossa mentality that is still affecting uh, not only the leadership in the Kremlin, but also the military doctrine. So anything is from, from deterrence, uh, from mobilization, from defense planning, comes from the, the shock that the Soviet Union lived through the, the surprise of the Operation Barbarossa. So the threat becomes an existential threat coming from Nazi Germany, so-called the Barbarossa mentality. That's why I have the fourth definition of Nazism, which is an existential threat. Now moving to then understanding why that has become, uh, why that has led to the war as a justification, I looked at the military doctrine of the Russian Federation. And there are quite few points uh, which I see that can be connected 
to the points, the ideology that I just uh, I just mentioned in my presentation. And a few of them are, just to mention them, uh, the expansion of NATO, seen as the enemy that tries to break the unity, pulling away post-Soviet republics from the influence of Russia, so breaking that unity. That's the expansion of NATO. And then inter-ethnic and uh, inter-confessional tensions instigated by the international radical groups at the border with the Russian Federation. And maybe the third one is even clearer, is that the creation of regimes in neighboring countries, including those who came by power, overthrowing the previous leg legitimate government, and whose ideas, whose policies, threaten the interests of the Russian Federation. So this is quoting directly the, the military doctrine. So in, in conclusion, um, going through just summarizing the ideas I found in the, in the sources, we see that the legacy of the past still affects very vividly the Kremlin and the Russian leadership. And especially concerning is this narrative of creation of national identity seen as extreme nationalism and therefore wanted to break away from the past of the Soviet Union. That is seen as a threat to, the Soviet, uh, to Russia. Um, so that is, is concerning, especially because we want to see um, in, if it is a pattern that can be repeated also in other parts of the post-Soviet space. I'm saying this because my dissertation is about early warning mechanisms in the post-Soviet space, and that was the interest in me to look deeper into this question, so whether we can see some patterns. And then another thing that uh, maybe we can discuss further uh, in, uh, with the questions, so in the open discussions, uh, is really what I was mentioning in the beginning, to what extent is this propaganda, or to what extent do Russian people really believe it? Um, I've read some, in some, some news that Russian soldiers go to Ukrainian villages and say, we came here to liberate you. And the reaction is, I can, I can let you understand what the reaction is. So um, to, really, to what extent is the propaganda has succeeded? And we can no longer call it propaganda. It's becoming an ideology. And how deeply is it rooted? This is something that maybe it's a topic for a, a different research question, um, and maybe it's too soon for us to know. We will probably not know uh, at this point yet. Um, so with this, I would conclude my presentation. Thank, thank you so much, Marcian. And I, I'm sorry I forgot to say that you are a doctoral researcher at the NDU, so that's a proper uh, presentation. So. Would there be any quick questions? Because I think you left with us with very good questions that we could explore uh, during the during the panel. We we have some some views on that. But any any kind of quick, quick questions at, at this point? I don't see I don't see any. I have some, but I'm I'm thinking I'm preserving them for the pa panel discussion. So thank you so much. That was really really interesting. With all the so then the, finally we have Santeri Kitoneva uh, who is working as a research assistant at the Russia group at the NDU and also then now I remember to say a doctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki and he will speak on strategic objectives of Russia's attack and in relation to Kremlin's political rhetoric. Thank you, thank very you. Much. thank you, Gasser, and thank you very much for the earlier presentations. My presentation will take a wider picture and sort of zoom out on the details that were discussed here. And I'm happy to link this all together because I've paid attention to the same concepts also. But in my presentation, I want to concentrate on how they were actually linked together.
to the actual military implementation in Ukraine and also broadly look at like uh, how should we position ourselves in relation to the Kremlin propaganda because as we as Marcia said the goal for the Russian military armed forces was to denazify and demilitarize and I want to look at what can be read from these Putin speeches. So the structure of my presentation is the following. First I will introduce the team and the pre present the key concepts of the presentation from the Russian military sciences and the political speeches. And thirdly I want to look at the Russia's initial strategic objective building on the research we have conducted here at the Finnish National Defense University during the previous year and then I look to connect this all together to the justification of the special military operation. And finally I aim to keep this all together <laughs> in the presentation. And I also want to emphasize, like many of the presentations we have heard today, that my findings are also preliminary in nature and the topic of my talk is a huge one. And there's, there's a lot left to cover about the last year of 2022 and I will only scratch the surface here in my presentation. So here are the research questions on the slide. So the first question is looking for a strategic objective in the operation and was there actually one and how can we conceptualize it? And if yes, then we can look at the second question and look at how this strategic objective evolves in relation to what Putin says in his speeches after the initial failure to achieve the set objective. And the broad question is of course how should we relate, position ourselves as re researchers to this Kremlin's propaganda and uh, because I want to argue that even though it, the, the, so as a source material it's difficult to work with but it is what we have so we should, should also study it and we have to take it into consideration and there is definitely some value to be taken from it. So the first, these are the findings I will elaborate on. So first I want to conceptualize the so-called special military operation as a strategic operation with then a strategic op objective. And this is my, I argue that this offers a good theoretical framework from these Russian concepts, Russian military scientific concepts that can be used to describe the broad level of the phenomena. And I also want to argue that as time passes, Russia's attack shifts in the war, so the operation is then extended in the war, and at this point, it's a bit different story, then we, we can no longer look for a clear strategic objective, so to say. And of course, we have to keep in mind the Clausewitzian definition of war, which is that the politics is it's a means to achieve certain political objectives, so this political goals should be considered and that's the red line of my presentation and it's not a very straightforward at all but I want to look at how then these political goals can be linked together to the military scientific implementation or can they be linked together and what is used in the political speeches is the concept of special military operation and I want to argue also that this is a very slippery political concept. It's a good instrument for the Kremlin to use this concept, but it should not be taken very seriously, it's sort of as a military scientific concept. And I would 
prefer to use the concept of strategic operation. And then we have these two concepts that were clarified also in the earlier presentations, the denazification and demilitarization. And the question is then how do these fit into the picture? And I want to look at them as a link between these two levels. And now I will very shortly look at the definition of strategic objective and the reason for using this concept is because it's widely used in the Russian military scientific encyclopedias and also in the theoretical discussion. So it is a central one and it has been defined for a long time in these official encyclopedias. Of course, there are a lot of gaps that are left there and it's it also offers challenges for us then as researchers to fill in these gaps and try to use the concept with its limitations. But it is uh, widely recognized and it has remained widely unchanged. That's why I think it's a very key concept we should consider. And also the strategic, strategic objective here, it is defined as a goal uh, of uh, operation, war or campaign at the strategic level, which means the very broad level, of course. And, and here I have a very simplified process of, the, of how I see the definition of a strategic objective then. So, of course, it's a very multifaceted process and it largely involves political evaluation and there are many underlying mechanisms and maybe we can return to the discussion, of course, what was mentioned, uh, Putin's essay from last year, maybe as a Marxist topic, as an early warning mechanism kind of way, but... Uh, but in this graph, I have just simplified it quite a bit. So the way I see it is that, then it, that the strategic operation is a large-scale military operation with the aim of changing the military, political and strategical setting significantly. And the goals are defined as strategic objectives. So this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the strategic objectives and political goals. So, as mentioned, the political goals we can get from the Putin's speech on the 24th of February. And also the concept of political goal, of, of course, is an elusive one. And I will just want to emphasize here that the goals threat from Putin's speeches directly are, of course, political due to the setting they are delivered in and the audience they are targeted to. And this is why I then look to translate these concepts into the military scientific terms. And as know that these two concepts come up from the speech given on the 24th of February, and I also want to very briefly define these concepts, although they have been were very well elaborated by my colleagues here, but uh, as, noted, as noted, the denazification, in my view, is a concept denoting the aim to change the Ukrainian leadership completely, and it draws very heavily on enemy images from the Great Patriotic War and certain historical images, enemy images. And Putin in his speeches also uses the concept of neo-Nazism to refer to Ukrainian <coughs> nationalism. So therefore he parallels these two with the prefix of neo, neo in there to denote 
very falsely any kind of Ukrainian nationalism, although it's not nationalism in the first place, as a radical form of neo-Nazism, which is which is then used to justify justify the war. So so any form of support for Ukrainian sovereignty is deemed as a neo-Nazism then. And the second concept, demilitarization, in my view, it refers to destroying the working capabilities of Ukrainian armed forces and to put the Ukrainian armed forces in a state where they cannot function for under any command and for unified goals. So they aimed. To, so the demilitarization is about discipling disabling the working capabilities of Ukrainian armed forces. And also interesting to note on this concept is the the de prefix on both of them. And I think this is something we can also return on the dis discussion, but uh, also these concepts are sort of defined as coming from the opposite. And it's also that these concepts, in addition to with the special military operations, are then very shifting in con context and large, so they can use be so they can be used very effectively as political instruments then to justify the war. And they will work together in different different settings. Now, before I move on to the exploring the possible changes in the rhetoric, I want to summarize the conceptualization of the initial calls, which was to subjugate Ukraine under Russian control and influence. And I also argue that during the year of 2022, this in fact remained the same. It, do it doesn't seem like the, the Kremlin was ready to re-evaluate this. And here's a brief image from the from our forthcoming research with uh, Jukka Vitaniemi here with the implementation of the ground force operations on the 24th and the dotted lines are interpreted goals of the operation which were in reality of course never achieved but uh, the text in Finnish merely denotes the military di districts of the Russian. So it was organized as a, well, one way to conceptualize is, is a strategic operation with four group formations in accordance with the military districts. So then when looking at the goals of from this point of view, from the actual implementation, it looks like, well, firstly, as noted, the aim of changing the Ukrainian control government was very much key, and also the disabling of Ukrainian armed forces functioning and uh, attacks directed at critical infrastructure. And thirdly, I also want to claim that they did indeed look to control territorial control, even though this was never admitted in the political rhetoric. And this is one of the contradictions from the actual reality and the political speeches. So, of course, this is uh, something we could spend a lot of time discussing, but I will just briefly mention some of the <coughs> explanations for the initial failure. Of course, as was said, the lack of forces, the ground forces for this kind of attack with this kind of massive territory is simply the Russian armed force did not have enough 
ground forces for such a convi conventional taking classic operation. And also we, we should also, of course, look at the estimates of these capabilities and how they match with the reality. And uh, of course, then there's the question of doctrine. Was this according to the Russian doctrine or was it incorrect use? And what are the, what are the developments going forward? Now, when you, we look at the Kremlin's reaction following the initial days, it was for quite a long time that everything is going to plan, even though we can safely assume that they were aware that this was not in fact the case. But I think one of the first signs possibly we can interpret is the meeting with uh, Shoigu and Gerasimov on uh, increasing the readiness of strategic missile force of Russian armed forces. And I want to bring our attention to the latter half of March because I think this offers some very interesting hints on how the political rhetoric evolved. So on the 16th of March, Putin uh, it can be in the red, Putin gives hints on the upcoming on the upcoming announcements by the Alexander Fomin and Igor Konoshenko on the fact that uh, in his speech on the 16th of March, Putin says that uh, well he acknowledges that there were in fact Russian troops around the Kiev and Chernikov direction. But he then goes on to say that they were not looking to capture any ground territory and now their task is completed, so they are getting out of there, which yeah, I think we can agree that this is very much against reality, of course. And this is one, of, one, one example of where we should look, look at this political speeches with very much caution. But, uh, but then following this, Alexander Fomin at the end of March then says that uh, in negotiations in Istanbul between Ukraine and Russia, that they were, they were well, according to Fomin, this is the reasoning underlying why Russia is ready to take troops out of there. Kiev and Chernikov directions, but once again I want to emphasize that this is also false because at this point most of the troops have already retreated from these areas and this is simply a political justification of measures for the measure that uh, they simply put together there to give a reasoning to the operation and, and then the <laughs> Briefing the Defense Ministry for me notes that the operation will move into next phase and this will not involve north, uh, north of Ukraine. And once again, I think it's interesting to look at the timeline on these. It's at the end of the March, so it's very delayed. So the political rhetoric very much reacts with delay and very much against the reality. And I will, I will very briefly just, I want to touch on the Victory Day recap by Putin because it's a great example of using the Nazi, nationalism and Nazism in very aggressively. And of course the timing is for the Victory Day, which is a very important memory day for the Great Patriotic War, so they are using it to bring parallels towards the situation in Ukraine and the Second World War, which is, of course, once again, use of history politics and not actually very closely re related to reality. And also, when looking at Lavrov and Patrushev in the 
summer months, I think it's interesting to note that Patrushev says on the 5th of Ju July that the initial goals of the operation, denazification and demilitarization still hold. And once again, I think these concepts are largely political and therefore they can be used with such a loose definitions and they are used here as instruments once again. And then Lavrov at the end of the same month then says that the goals are not limited to Donbass region and there at this point it's quite apparent that Russia is also looking to capture the gain control of Saborich and Herson regions. And then I want to bring forward the fact that, in my view, the concept of justifying the war from Ukrainian point of view hardly changed until the end of September when mobilization is announced. And when Putin announced the mobilization is noteworthy also, he used the formulation on the recommendation of general staff and ministry of defense, which is different to the February March. So he was very, the tone is very much different. And also, I think these are all signals of what I look to argue that the political goals of the Kremlin did not change at all. Rather, these are measures that they then take at the end of the year to keep driving these goals towards, towards the end goal. And also, I argue that the political rhetoric becomes a bit harsher in tone in the fall months and it looks to incorporate more more elements like, uh, for example, the quote on Nazism, uh, no, sorry, Satanism, which was uh, regarding the speech on illegally annexing the four regions as part of Russia directly. So, to bring this all together as conclusions, I want to once again emphasize that these findings are preliminary and limited to the last year, but it, there were no signs of Kremlin looking to back down politically from its commitment to subjugate Ukraine under its influence, and rather it seems like uh, different measures of justifying the operation are even more, becoming even more merged together to to justify the war. And here I've brought some pointers from certain sources which, as the first one, as was noted, it's very much related to the idea of anti-Russia project and the fact that the Russia does not recognize the role of Ukraine as a sovereign state and the official rhetoric very much downplays the role of Ukraine's sovereignty and it is defined only as a contrast term, as anti-Russia and as the means of the West to harm Russia. And then also I think another aspect I look to study in my dissertation regarding civil religion and patriotic education bringing forward aspects of sacrifice and glory for the lives of the lost so, ro ro Russian soldiers and of course this is also related to the question Marcia left us on like uh, how deeply embedded can they actually go like uh, are, is it so effective that it becomes part of the world we as the as the individual Russian soldier thinks that he is in fact sacrificing his life for greater good and of course this is a uh, very troubling sign for the future future years. And now just to return, I want to once again emphasize that the concepts I have introduced, strategic operations, strategic objective, these offer a solid theoretical 
framework to study to study the so-called special military operation, which was the largest largest operation that the Russian armed forces conducted, utilizing almost well all of its peacetime ground forces and. And I want to argue that the political goals remain the same, although they failed to achieve the first strategic objective they set. And then, of course, thirdly, how should we study these sources in relation to empirical evidence? And by empirical evidence, I mean footage from Telegram and Ukraine official sources on what actually happens. I think we need to we need to consider the limitations, but at the same time, it's all we have. So there is definitely some value to be gained from them. And I think I am done here, and we can move on to the panel discussion. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as Let's move to the panel, so I'd like to ask other presenters to take the floor. We have chairs. This camera, like this. If you, if you take um, I, I have a couple of questions to, to everyone, um, but I think as a as a panel we we we, uh, we could we could uh, discuss the the idea that you, Marcia, put nicely that um, thinking of propaganda uh, or disinformation disinformation uh, as a tool to achieve some limited limited uh, objectives and then on the ha other hand we have the idea or problem of world view uh, that informs the models of thinking and, and the way of uh, perceiving the, the world and uh, I think we are here we have the, both of these issues are, are problem and, and the war in a way is a laboratory or forum for shaping shaping the current and future Russian Russian uh, discourse and maybe the maybe the world view. So we can we can kind of uh, think about this this uh, two level problem in, in our heads while while we discuss. But if I go in the order of, of appearance, a couple of questions, and then open floor for, for more questions. Uh, while, while you were talking here, I, I, I was thinking of, um, I, I've been quite um, impressed by uh, writings from the early 90s by Russian philosopher Mikhail Epstein, who wrote about the totalitarian discourse. And he had this kind of idea that there is this syllogisms, the ideological language and the concepts are those that combine the factual, integrate in a way factual concept with the evalua evaluative meaning. And by applying this idea, we could maybe argue that the nationalism that Putin speaks of is the kind of given the negative, negative value and then at the same time, he is speaking of patriotism as a, as a positive value. So it's the way of, a way of, uh, in a way, organizing the reality into negative and positive, which is very typical for Russian, Russian thinking. So maybe uh, as just as a methodological question, if you find this interesting way to to organize your research, but then the other question, more more obvious one, was that. You don't. Uh, you didn't refer to the uh, idea of state civilization uh, or the civilizational discourse in in Russian Russian uh, Russian political classes for the last years. So, uh, 
would you think that it would be useful for you, or do you think that you can you can get <laughs> get not not have that that concept in in your research? Maybe we start with yeah. Start okay. With this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, lots of interesting questions and stimulus for for the. Uh, research. Actually, I will start with this nationalism and patriotism uh, distinction because indeed these are two forms of uh, uh, national attachment and, uh, and, and both of them have different scales like in case of nationalism you may find moderate and extreme forms and the same applies for, uh, for, for, for patriotism. Uh, although uh, patriotism doesn't bring forward this ethnic aspects, uh, uh, ethnic aspects uh, so much, uh, but yeah, but it, it comes uh, back to the way how do you define the concepts. But I think uh, kind of all in, what what I'm thinking about is that um, is that. Uh, I, I cannot st st still find the right word for what, what's going on in Russian discourse. It's sort of upside down, it reverses everything, but I haven't found the, the best, uh, best uh, disc descriptive of it yet, but it, 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 it really kind of said turn everything upside down. And basically what they uh, call uh, patriotism, because they avoid the concept of nationalism, they use it uh, uh, they use it as a, in, in this negative meaning to attribute to others, but themselves they very much uh, develop this patriotism. But uh, I, I I would say that what they uh, what they describe as patriotism actually would be this extreme form of uh, of uh, of uh, nationalism, uh, because it's pretty much it's centered around the interests of uh, Russian speakers of. Uh, com Compatriots, and 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 I think in uh, in Santeri's presentation you showed very nicely this conflict between different states, and there is indeed a fundamental conflict between Russia and neighboring countries. For example, uh, Latvia as a national state, the goal of our state is uh, to make sustainable Latvian national culture. That's obvious goal for national uh, national state. Uh, on the other hand, for Russia, as it, uh, it, it's uh, for them, it is important to uh, uh, to promote Russian language and culture, which comes into uh, which, which which is uh, problematic. Uh, so uh, yeah, so so this regards this uh, definitions. Uh, and, and your question about, yes, this distinct civilizations that Russia kind of distances itself from, uh, from the West, that they, are, um, that they are different. And I think this probably relates to, uh, to the question of this uh, propaganda issue. So is it just, just discourse or do people really, uh, really, re really believe it? Uh, I don't have a, a, a clear ans answer yet. I initially, I would I, I, I thought that yeah, indeed this uh, formulation of uh, Russia as a distinct civilization that it's largely a construct used for propaganda purposes. But uh, but but maybe if we would do some deeper anthropological studies, probably indeed there are some. Uh, uh, there are some uh, some uh, differences, but also in this nationalism uh, discourse. Uh, uh, yeah, final comment from me, and then I will stop and give word to others. But 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 from Patrushev's uh, papers also that uh, that uh, Russia is distinct civilization, and Russia is never violent. It, it's West that is violent, and again this comes back to this. Uh, really turning everything upside down. So it's mm -hmm. really how to grasp it and how to conceptualize it. Yes, yeah. yes. If there, yes, please. Um. Okay. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for brilliantly pointing out from various angles of the, what I, as a military analyst, uh, feel is incoherence in the Russian arguments. They, they simply don't stick together. It doesn't make sense. Am I right in that, number two, does it matter from a Russian perspective? Does it have to be coherent to still have a kind of propaganda effect where it doesn't risk actually just, at the end of the day, implode because of its own you know, lack of logic? But, 
it's for all of us oh, or just for yeah. all of us? Okay. Yeah. Well, m m maybe I can, on the basis of m my research, uh, we, in 2016, when we studied the first phase of, the, of this <coughs> war, we, we used, I think I borrowed it somewhere, and you can look from, the, from our report, uh, there's this uh, wonderful word, uh, words of distraction. So they are these propaganda words or concepts that are used for the purpose of distraction. So they, that's the, uh, what they want to achieve, to create this confusion. And there, we shouldn't be waiting for that there is some kind of a consistent uh, one idea. But, but, but the fact that it is or, or, um, that the factual evidence or truth, in a way, is is not the basis of an, anything in creating these propaganda narratives, uh, makes it easier for this for this system to to operate with with uh, totally uh, uh, totally opposite concepts. But but I think I, I I've been. <laughs> That's what, what I think uh, my research tries to do is to actually think that it is becoming a totalitarian discourse in a sense that there is more coherence and more hierarchy between the things. But, but your question actually led me to my, my question uh, to Marcia that, um, and what, what I actually already said, that I'm, I'm a bit confused uh, with with this comparative approach when, when studying the Russian uh, disinformation uh, uh, projects. Because, yes, there were uh, certain historical um, events in, in, U in Ukraine's history that are taken from the context and used in the purposes of, of war rhetoric. And so, um, so uh, would it be make more sense to try to understand the overall logic of this Russian disinformation system, and then the place of denazification in that system, rather than go through these historical examples of Nazis in in Ukrainian history, etc., like. Because then, but then you would need to, in a way, accept that it it's, uh, uh, doesn't have any actual connection with the reality. And therefore, I would argue that the, the concept of denazification, it is simply a cover for <coughs> occupation. Occupation of the regions that Russia now happens to, in a way, hold. And then it would lead you to, to research how this term is used in the practices of occupation, if it's used or if it's not used, rather than try to look into the, some historical actual events. But maybe you can also do this together, so uh, it's possible to combine, but um, because of, I think we, um, the, the Putin in a way keeps it quite in a fog, like what it exactly is. But then when you look at the Russian military writings, for example, it's already more defined that, yeah, it is the, the kind of occupation that uh, was done after the Second World War, a complete change of the people's, people's kind of thinking. In, in this area, so um, so what, yeah. Uh, how how do you see? My, I'm kind of asking about your design, your research design. Um, thanks. Thanks for the question. It's very yeah, very interesting. And uh, maybe I start um, by saying that it's a, it was really looking at the sources. So looking at starting from history was not my choice, but what I could see in the sources, so in academic sources. So this is where the scope of my research was really looking how scholars now based in Russia 
um, they are all the back the Kremlin, so how they justify, how they portray the idea of Nazism. So that was my starting point. And based on that, I tried then to categorize into the, you know, how I put it in our presentation. So we're looking at history, so it has reference to the Second World War, has reference to the, the nationalism, has then reference to the idea of unity. So this is something that it's, uh, it's not my design, but that's what I could find. And I would try to put some structure in, in that. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question also, the, the second point, whether denazification means occupation and they use it to justify it. Um, maybe it's my personal opinion is just deeper than that. It's, uh, it's part of the propaganda, but to what extent the propaganda has been integrated in the worldview, that's where we are trying to place the denazification concept as from purely propaganda or for something else. Um, this is a very interesting research question mm -hmm. that, that I think can be, it's really worth exploring more. Uh, and that's why the, the definition themselves that they used by, by the Kremlin was so fascinating for me to see well, what do they mean by denazification. Mm -hmm. um, and that's we're looking at the sources, but that's just the first step. I think the second step is really to look more like in depth of how it came about, when it was integrated, and how. Yeah. Um, and then to um, to say to reply to the gentleman's question about the logic. Um, I think there is a logic. I mean, I was trying to look for a logic in the sources, but that the existence of a logic that doesn't mean that it's realistic. It can be unrealistic, but can still be logical. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So our, I think as a researcher, or in, in the sphere of early warning and prevention, I think it is important to understand their logic. And even if it doesn't make sense, it's still important to see for us then how we can prioritize to deconstruct, to help the dialogue. So seen with the prisms of conflict prevention, that's what I think it's worth understanding the logic. Mm -hmm. Without agreeing with it, you know, not necessarily we agree, but finding the logic, it was not meaning to agree with it. Yeah, I, I would like to add a bit on, on Katri's very interesting question because what resonated with me what in your question was this construction of worldview. And I think it is very important also if you take a look at disinformation by Russia, what people tend to do, many debunkers of the disinformation, they take separate facts and try to explain them. But I think indeed the problem is that uh, what they are doing, uh, what Russians are doing in the long term, uh, that they are really creating a distinct worldview, and that's that's what makes it uh, difficult uh, difficult uh, to counter. And from my previous studies, so it it it, it consists of large themes which go into several sub themes and, 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 and different. It's like a it's like a big like like a spider or something. Mm -hmm. But it 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 it's Russophobia, it's anti-Westernism, it's uh, color revolutions. Uh, for it, uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's Russia's distant civilization, and, and there are some certain uh, certain uh, building blocks. And coming back to this consistency and inconsistency, the paradox is that in the in the long term they are consistent in a way that they repeat certain themes for decades. And I think that's what makes uh, why it's this worldview for some audiences that are receptible to this is quite. Uh, very influential and, and kind of de deeply, deeply ingrained. On the other hand, it may be inconsistent by using a contrary kind of, uh, on a tactical level, if you, you, if you may speak, it may be different. And also this uh, uh, un uh, uh, putting certain concepts in the fog, I think the same applies for traditional values that they exploit a lot. But when you really want to understand what those traditional values are, then you are sort of in a definitional trouble. It's not so easy. And I think it's great that what Martina did just to find the 
How do you define the analysis? Mm -hmm. It's difficult. Yeah. Yes, can I, can I uh, add on this? Have, yeah, yes, yes, please. And then. Yes, I also want to add on Johan's question. What he, he was just said is like when you look at the broader historical level and the mechanisms, it seems like there is something tying it together. But if you look at the very small scale, like uh, widespread propaganda, it does not need to be coherent at all. It's just uh, you can see that it's not not at all. But then, like as Katri noted on the Epstein's conceptions, of course, and then I think these are subordinate to some ideas that bring them the structure of it. And also, it's interesting when you have these concepts that are like. Uh, ideological and when you have someone reading them I don't think it really matters if they think it through in a way it just matters that they know not to challenge this concept and know not to think it through so at this level then it aims it's, it achieves its task mm -hmm. yes. Elena please and then Victoria uh, yes thank you uh, I, I have uh, one, uh, one comment and then one, uh, one question. My uh, comment is that, first of all, uh, thank you for all of your presentations. I, I like this, that this is uh, not just uh, uh, you know, the basic facts, what we all know uh, about what Putin has said and uh, about the uh, denazification and uh, the militarization uh, of Ukraine, but also I like Marshall when you said that uh, denazification, of course, it is, it, uh, it is propaganda and it is, yes, cover for, uh, for occupation, but not only. And uh, this matches with my findings uh, in my recent uh, research that uh, I am actually now uh, kind of uh, thinking, and it's my hypothesis, that uh, this denazification uh, is a cover for just another occupation. That actually the, uh, the, what is behind it is the <coughs> history of the bloodland uh, and the history of, of uh, the, the, not only the Second World War, but uh, before that, the history of pogroms and antisemitism and uh, uh, that has been uh, taboos in uh, history politics. And if we want to understand seriously what is it all about and why it is so difficult to tackle, then it's good to acknowledge that it has the uh, prehistory. Yes. And a uh, short comment uh, uh, is the same uh, Michael Epstein, who just recently, yes, yes about the apocalypse yes. book. I, I, because uh, you probably all know, it, it's, it's very funny, it's written in, uh, in Russian, and uh, it's, it's basically it's nonsense, but uh, I, I have not uh, read it from cover to cover. But I find it ex extremely interesting. It is uh, the uh, uh, history, hi uh, the first uh, philosophy of uh, the written philosophy of the first year of war. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Victoria, and then Amy. Uh, so really thank you for this, this panel and I'm very sorry to miss, miss some of this. It. Uh, it's I think very important to talk about ideological factors and propaganda as well as you know, military machinery movements. And my question is actually to, to Santere. Uh, it would be a difficult question, so please feel free to kind of disregard it and say whatever you want. But I, I, I thought I would try my life based uh, on your uh, last slide. Uh, so you described this uh, difference uh, between sort of political goals and territorial gains, and you showed how the territorial uh, goals sort of changed throughout the campaign. Um, could you describe the minimal territorial and legal scenario, uh, which is enough for Russia to achieve its uh, political goals? Uh, as you <laughs> yes, so, so as you said, it's a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. The short answer is no, because I think it's. Uh, but yes, I think uh, 
Of course, it's a very hypothetical, theoretical question, question then, like what would be enough for them? And in my view, well, you can find some sort of like pragmatic level to this, which would lead to the answer that they would be fine with you, like having a good amount of territorial control, but leaving sort of a space for Ukraine to breathe, of course, but uh, then you have these very deep, uh, like darker themes and it seems like uh, they would not be satisfied with this and it's just a matter of like going further and further so it would be like deeply embedded in the, in the like, uh, yes, the me decision making and state mechanism and the ideology and I, I cannot give you the answer between these two, but it's a very good question and I, I will definitely think about it and thank you. Amy. Yes, hi, hi I'm Emil Mitekka, doctor of research at the University of Helsinki. Thanks for all of you for your presentations. Actually, I have one comment to Marcia's question. I had exactly the same question in mind, but then you kind of like <laughs> asked it. But a uh, short comment to it and then follow up question. So I think uh, if we think about how deeply rooted this uh, kind of like enemy images or uh, nationalist or patriotic narratives or ideas are uh, among the population, uh, there are some indicators that maybe not, not so deep, but I think that uh, media plays like a surprisingly uh, significant role in, in shaping these uh, images because I just remember some years ago, was it 2019 when uh, Turkey down, uh, shut down this uh, Suboy destroyer uh, some, some, some years ago. So anyways, like, and uh, then there's a public opinion uh, polls on conducted, for instance, by the Center about uh, like these, uh, which countries do you perceive as uh, like uh, friendly countries and which, which countries you perceive as, as kind of like enemy countries. It's maybe not the best laid out questions, but I think uh, think that the results with, with this uh, Turkey were, were quite interesting because it was for many many years it was just like maybe one percent uh, of, of, of the respondents uh, saying that okay we think it's uh, an enemy country and then this was this great <laughs> accident and it jumped down to like 20 percent and then after that it's already like uh, down to the same number of like one or two percent and then I compared it to the, uh, how it was uh, how uh, enemy and Turkey were presented in Russian media according to this uh, in the group database. And the, the, the curve is like, the correlation is like pretty close to 100, like how, how they go up. So I, I think that uh, it kind of does, maybe also these enemy images can be constructed or like in, in this way, but they might be not like super deeply rooted. So this was the short comment, and, and then follow question is uh, maybe to all of you, but um, like uh, it's the same questions you asked, but in in what about in like Russian uh, minorities in, in or Russian speakers in in in, in Russian nearby countries with have sizable uh, Russian speaking minorities like uh, Latvia and Estonia? Do you think that these uh, these enemy images and, and uh, images of uh, narratives of uh, patriotism and nationalism are like, uh, mm -hmm. do they resonate well there? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, okay, so if it's a question about ethnic minorities in the Baltic states, I guess it's, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's yeah, my yeah, area yeah, of yeah, expertise. Yeah. yeah, and indeed I have, uh, yeah, well, well, this question about the effects of propaganda was brought up, yeah, I, I, I thought in my mind how, uh, what I would say, and, and exactly what I recalled, uh, is that I have been doing uh, studies w about Russian ethnic minorities, including focus groups, and uh, and and of course uh, those questions of national attachments are important. And uh, and uh, yeah, one answer that uh, that comes up often. So if, if, let's say if you ask them, is it important to be a patriot? Then very often uh, uh, Russian speakers of Latvia says. Uh, 
yes, it's important to be patriot, but not nationalist. And 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 before I just uh, and some time ago I thought that it's really like it's 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 our local uh, situation. But now I think uh, uh, that probably it is some effects of uh, Russian uh, Russian uh, media presence, this critical attitude towards nationalism. So I, um, th this is my one of uh, my um, uh, hypotheses. Uh, but all in all, just the recent study that we did, what is important to say about uh, Russian uh, ethnic minorities in uh, in the Baltic states, uh, uh, first of all, this um, what we can notice in the long term and even more so in uh, during the last year, is that Russia's influence uh, on Russian ethnic minorities uh, in Latvia, uh, I can speak about this, it is decreasing because uh, attachments to Russia, sense of belonging to Russia, it, it, it gradually decreases. Uh, we did a study in October uh, last uh, year and among Latvia's Russian speakers, only 20% says that they have any feel, sense of belonging to Russia. A bit more is the sense of belonging to the Soviet Union. So this gives an idea that it's larger, it's some historical, but it's not to contemporary Russia. And one interesting change that took place uh, during the last year, one of the huge problems that we had, and this also relates to this Russian worldview, is that they built, in the long term, they construct this uh, 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 world views that Russia is a peaceful country. Russia never attacks. Russia only uh, only defends itself. And 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 when you looked at the threat perception in Latvia, <coughs> um, uh, what was the problem? That only like around ten percent, maybe a little bit more, considered Russia potentially be a threat. And this was something that made really difficult for uh, for uh, government of our uh, of for, for foreign policy and to explain foreign policy and to explain defense policy. Wh why do we do what we do if Russia is not a threat? What has happened now, really? Uh, at least the data that uh, we have is that uh, this uh, understanding that Russia potentially is a threat it has significantly increased also among Latvia's Russian speakers. So now it was um, around fifty percent. So it's a huge, uh, it's a huge, uh, uh, it's a huge uh, change. Uh, at the same time, of course, we have, uh, again, long-term problems that, of course, this group of people, it express, it, it, it is more politically alienated. And due to all these nationalist discourses from Russia, etc., and, 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 of course, it, it, it makes a very complicated uh, context. But, yeah, but it, in some interesting trends uh, in this group, indeed, yeah. One very short Absolutely. question related to this. So yeah. Is there anything about uh, how they relate to the Ukraine war in general? Like, are they supportive or? Uh uh, yeah, it was uh, from from some other data. Uh, when uh, um, it's not in, uh, in 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 the study of our center, but uh, um, Latvian public television did some study, and and the pro uh, and um, yeah. And, and the, the problem was that almost half of them are in the gray zone in the sense that they don't say anything. And, and, it, be, and it has become, what sociologists say, that it has become pretty difficult to uh, do, uh, to conduct a study because they tend to say their opinion, but uh, if uh, uh, some quarter or something like that, that clearly said that they, uh, uh, condemned Russia's activities, some, the same uh, uh, amount of people supported and, and largest didn't say anything. But that was uh, the early stages of conflict. I think it changes dynamically also. I think this public opinion changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I can answer a really great question. Thank you so much. I just took some notes, um, so the reply. Um, the idea of the enemy, so you mentioned uh, Turkey. 
But the interesting thing about the denazification <laughs> is that enemy is not a country, but it's an, an idea. Mm. That I think is an important distinction to keep in mind. It's mm. an the ideology which is opposite, it's an antipode of the Soviet ideology. And that in that is one point. The second point, when you look at facts, and again you use Turkey as an example. And I understand, so contemporary events or current affairs, if you see how the state media propaganda is portraying it, and then you ask the population, you may see a fluctuation. Mm. Um, but if you take historical facts, that I think becomes um, more uniformed and slightly more concerning. One example is, um, it's the siege of Leningrad. I was talking to some Russian friends of mine lately, and I'm from Italy, but I, I moved to Finland three years ago, so, and then I, yeah, I learned about the, the, um, the Winter War, which is something that we didn't study at school. I found it very fascinating. And by the way, I think the Russians they are admitting it now, more, more increasingly their role in not only be like a peaceful nation, but that's like one of the dark pages of the history was the, the Winter War. Um, but um, just, to, just a short digression. To go back to your question, so the siege of Leningrad, he's seen by, uh, by the Russians as that the Finnish were contributing to the siege of Leningrad. And he's also contemporary, educated abroad, um, the young generations of, of, of Russians. Uh, why, uh, there's a very different narrative from what I hear in, uh, in Finland. Yes. Um, so this is what I find, uh, and is this propaganda? Can you call it propaganda if it's something so, that they see so obvious? And, uh, and I'm, I say, no, but that's not what they're telling me in Finland. <laughs> so what is, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, that's the difference and maybe I want, I was referring to in my presentation how some historical facts are really um, <coughs> so deeply uh, contested. Yeah. Just you know, and about the Russian minority is a great question. So I was really happy to hear you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But also, I think the change is really after the, the invasion of Ukraine. That made a, a significant change, I would say. That before, maybe what they thought, um, the, the, Russian, uh, the Russian minorities, was not even that important. Just the fact they existed was a pretext, and maybe for Russia to... Um, keep an eye on the neighboring countries. You see what I mean? So it's, uh, it's about the, the fair existence. What they think may not have been so relevant. But now, after the invasion of Ukraine, it be, becomes a different issue. So, great. Thanks. One, one comment to, to, to what you just said. I, I was just thinking that maybe um, sometimes researchers do so that when they can't find a um, kind of good solution for using certain concepts, they, they take the third, <laughs> third one. And I was just thinking what, what you were saying, uh, which is very, very correct, that maybe for your research design in, in solving your research task, the, the concept of memory politics could actually work better than trying to sort of trying to uh, make, make sure that or ascertain that it is uh, propaganda or something. And, and why I'm saying this is that I found just recently a, a huge research done by the Russian um, um, General Staff Academy where, where there is a one, one part of it is, is sort of arguing that uh, Russia's great power status today is is sort of dependent on how how the victory Russia's victory in Second World War is is seen, and this they have of course commission for falsification of of uh, history, etc. So I think what you have found already in your research would benefit from from conceptualizing it as part of the memory politics that is a high politics in Russia. Unfortunately, because they, that's what they have to offer as an ideological basis uh, rather than any, any sort of a Soviet 
type of future oriented <laughs> oriented thing so they now now dies they went to the other, other direction in in a way so maybe maybe that would maybe that would work to tie together your findings in in the empirical analysis all right um would there be other questions are we happy <laughs> any any comments to to each other or? no I, I just cannot yeah i agree with this propaganda definition that it is problematic yeah i'm, I'm, I'm always also struggling with because i think yeah propaganda is not uh, relevant maybe strategic communications or some strategic narratives or something yeah because it's much broader yeah it's much broader yeah, it's yeah. much long term it's much it has lots of dimensions yeah <laughs> yeah and it's it's like yeah. on its core is uh, disregard for reality so it should yeah. be called disinformation but then there are aspects of of, mm -hmm. of appealing for the thinking mind <laughs> sometimes. All right. Uh, thank you so much for great presentations and for coming to and, and also for the audience for participating. So thank you.
Я чую Степана, але не чую Євгенія.
I hope we will overcome them. Uh, this is the uh, Russian seminar session five, and we will uh, be uh, the topic will be maritime aspects, so naval warfare. And I'm glad to be the uh, moderator. I am Commander Jere Pentla here at the Finnish uh, National Defense University as the principal teacher of uh, naval warfare. And uh, this afternoon we will have an extremely uh, interesting session. We have three expert speakers, two colleagues from uh, Ukraine, and then we have Dr. Stephen Blank from uh, the U.S. And, and as the uh, first speaker, we will have uh, Yevgeny Vyovsky, uh, Master of Arts, Captain Navy. He's a doctoral researcher at the Naval Department of National Defense University of Ukraine, and he has worked as a commander of the hydroacoustic team of the anti-submarine ship, as an engineer of the radio technical combat unit of the anti-submarine ship, officer of the combat training department of the Naval Operations Center, deputy chief of staff of the surface ship brigade, operation planning officer, in the headquarters of the Ukrainian Navy and deputy head of the main operation department in the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine. It's an honor to have you here, Captain, as a speaker, and the floor is yours. Second, the secret nature of operation, uh, the fact that different people need different days of different And this is actually very common in the state of Hmong, the European military. Yeah. From Stepan's computer. Uh, I am ready. Uh, have a good day. Uh, my name is Doris Evgeny. I am PhD student of Naval Forces Department of National Defense University of Ukraine. Uh, the topic of uh, my presentation is uh, Russia operations against maritime communications, uh, main conclusions and lessons from the experience of protecting uh, the economic activities uh, of the state at sea in the condition of the Russia-Ukrainian war. Uh, I hope my presentation will be interesting and useful for you. Uh, 
On February 24 uh, of the last year, the Russia Federation went to uh, a full scale armed aggression against Ukraine. At the same time, the armed forces of the Russia Federation declared the northwest western part of the Black Sea uh, and war risk area, and its armed forces began uh, implementing uh, actions to block uh, the seaports of Ukraine and attack civilian vessels uh, that were in and near Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea. However, uh, considering the actions of the Russia Federations against uh, maritime communications of Ukraine, it should be noted uh, that uh, began uh, long before February of the last year. Uh, these actions began after the occupation and uh, subsequent uh, annexation of Crimea in uh, 2014 and were carried out in the uh, form of hybrid actions. Uh, the occupation of Crimea created favorable conditionals of uh, carrying out uh, such actions, as it gave Russia the opportunity to take control of the Sea of Azov and gave the opportunity to employment uh, its uh, armed forces to act against uh, Ukraine maritime communications from the territory of peninsula. According to the intensity of the enemy's actions against the maritime communications of Ukraine, uh, they can be uh, conventionally divided into four stages. Uh, stage first, uh, enemy's low intensive hybrid actions aimed for complications uh, Ukrainian maritime communications. Uh, stage second, uh, intensification of the enemy's uh, hybrid influence of Ukrainian maritime communications. Stage three, uh, uh, third, uh, enemy's actions to block Ukrainian sea ports and vessels routes. Uh, and uh, stage fourth, enemy's uh, hybrid actions to complicate the functioning on the grain corridor. Uh, during the first stage, the Russian Federation established illegal control of ma marine traffic in the Kerch Strait, as well as uh, peri periodically closed maritime areas under the pretext uh, of military training. Uh, thus, uh, in uh, accordance with uh, the agreement between uh, Ukraine and Russia, traffic uh, through the Kerch Yenikel Canal this connect uh, the Sea of Azov and Black Sea is regular uh, uh, by Ukraine. However, after the occupation of the peninsula, de facto the rules of navigation established by the Russia Federation apply in the canal. Uh, since April 2018, the second stage of the enemy's hybrid influence on Ukraine maritime communications began. By this time, uh, the construction of the bridge across the Kerch Strait, uh, Crimean Bridge, uh, was completed. Russia has obtained uh, the capability to carry out unlawful control over the vessels passing the Kerch Strait and uh, to block the Ukrainian ports in the Sea of Azov at any time at uh, its will. It should be noted that due to the construction of the Crimean bridge of, by Russia, the moment of large tonnage uh, vessel under it was uh, restricted. Russia has imposed uh, restriction for Ukrainian ship uh, and uh, banned uh, vessel our uh, 160 meters length and uh, our 41 uh, meters uh, higher uh, from entering uh, the sea of Azov. Uh, the algorithm of Russia's uh, blockade of the Ukrainian coast of the sea of Azov from second stage uh, consists in the implementation of such actions. Uh, from May to June uh, 2018, Coast Guard of Russia's Federal Security Service, Border Patrol, 
began to detain without reason almost all ships that came to or from Mariupol uh, and Berdyansk within a few hours and uh, searched them. This led to ship uh, delays of uh, three or, or four hours. Uh, in the future, this algorithm was supplement with uh, new components. All vessels uh, that go from the Black Sea to the Ukrainian and uh, Russia ports in the Sea of Azov have to first uh, enter the anchorage in the catch state and uh, wait uh, there until the opposing uh, ship traffic passage to the strait. Sometimes uh, uh, there was no wait uh, at all, but typically uh, there was uh, in a one or two hours wait. At the same time, for vessels sailing to Mariupol and Berdyansk, this term has been increased uh, tenfold. Uh, that is, the process is uh, deliberately delayed. Ship are deliberately uh, not included in the northern traffic passing through the Kirch Strait. Uh, subsequently, the vessels were detained uh, in the Sea of Azov by Coast Guard of Russia Federal Security Service Border Patrol before entering the port of Mariupol and Berdyansk for search and later after leaving the port. Finally, uh, when already uh, loaded vessels approaches the Kesh Strait on the opposite side and enters a similar anchorage uh, where vessels have to get permission to uh, pass the Kesh Strait uh, from Azov to the Black Sea and then proceed uh, to Europe and Turkey in, instead uh, of the traditional one of two halves. They are delayed uh, there by 10, 15, or 30 hours. To sum up, uh, due to South Russia tactics, a vessel may close, uh, lose two, three, or four days uh, that have not been um, figured uh, calculation the duration of the run, which means uh, a significant damage. Uh, thus, the Russia Federation uh, gained uh, an opportunity to control the water space of the Sea of Azov. Uh, however, uh, Ukrainian uh, main export routes uh, are not uh, in the Sea of Azov, but it's uh, in the Black Sea from the Bosphorus to Odessa, Mikolaev, uh, and Kherson. Therefore, uh, it is not surprising that uh, in the future Russia extended uh, hybrid actions to the Black Sea. Since July uh, 2019, the Russian Federation has started actions to obstruct maritime communications of Ukraine in this water area as well. Uh, since then, the Russia Federation has systematically issued uh, navigational warnings uh, for area in which navigation is restricted or a navigational uh, hazard has been declared, which uh, has greatly complicated the conditions of uh, international ship. Uh, the clause uh, that uh, areas blocked uh, a significant uh, part of the recommended uh, CR rules in the exclusive economic zones of Ukraine and other countries uh, of the region. Uh, these actions continued until the beginning of the full scale invasion of the troops of the Russian Federation into Ukraine. So, for example, the enemy. Uh, enemy declared the areas uh, of the Black Sea and Sea of Azov uh, closed the navigation for ex exercise with missile and uh, artillery firing from February 13 to uh, 18. At the same time, uh, the 
indicated areas in the Black Sea were located up to the border uh, of the territorial sea of Ukraine and blocked uh, the recommend, recommended uh, sea routes to and from the sea ports of Ukraine. Once the, the goals of the military and political leadership of the Russia Federation during the full-scale armed aggression of the Russia Federation against Ukraine was to block <coughs> maritime communication of Ukraine. Uh, for this purpose, uh, the enemy declared uh, the areas of the Black Sea and Sea of Azov close to shipping and issues uh, uh, corresponding uh, coastal warnings. Uh, thus, the warning uh, prohibited the movement of the sea vessels in the north, northwestern part of the Black Sea uh, to the north of the Zmini Island latitude, and is in almost uh, the entire water area of the Sea of Azov, with uh, the exception of the Taganrog Bay. In addition, uh, the Russia Black uh, Sea Fleet began actions to block Ukrainian sea ports and attack uh, civilian vessels in and near Ukrainian ports. At the same time, the Russia Federation uh, continued to employment uh, elements of hybrid operational at sea. Uh, thus, of March uh, 18, uh, 2022, the sea ports of Sochi sent to warning uh, to uh, ship owners and ship captains uh, in the region about the uh, threat of uh, detonation of the Ukrainian Navy mines uh, drift, drifting in the Black Sea. In fact, the Russia uh, Black Sea Fleet mined uh, the recommendation routes uh, for commercial vessels from uh, the Bosphorus in the direction of Odessa, uh, covering it up uh, with lies about uh, the Ukrainian mines destroyed by storm. <coughs> the enemy used uh, sea mines uh, seized uh, from the uh, occupation uh, from the military uh, storages uh, of the naval forces of the armed forces of Ukraine during the occupation of Crimea. Uh, these actions were intended to prevent maritime traffic uh, of commercial vessel <coughs> in the north western part of Black Sea. I'm sorry. Uh, as a result of these actions, <coughs> the port industry of Ukraine actually ceased uh, to function and sea transformation almost stopped. Uh, this was due to the fact <coughs> that part of uh, the seaports uh, were captured by the enemy and some seaports. Uh, were forced to suspend work uh, due to the dangers for the sea transport. <coughs> Only sea uh, ports, uh, the, so uh, Rene, Ismail, and Uzdunansk, uh, sea, sea ports continued their work, but their share in the total processing uh, of the cargo by sea ports of Ukraine is traditionally small. <coughs> It should be noted uh, that the action uh, of the Russia Federation regarding block Ukrainian support and vessels routes uh, <coughs> led not only to economic problem in Ukraine. Thus, a report of the United Nations Conference on Trade the Development uh, entitled uh, Maritime Trade disrupted uh, the war in Ukraine and its effects on maritime trade log logistics published on uh, June 28 uh, of the last year. <clears throat> it was pointed uh, out uh, the extremely negative uh, con consequences of the Russia-Ukrainian war on the logistics uh, of international maritime trade. 
destruction of regional logistics, uh, helping for the port operation in Ukraine, destruction of the important uh, infrastructure uh, and higher fuel prices have Higher fuel price have led to logistical obstacle uh, in the Black Sea region and uh, uh, result to an increased uh, in the cost of sea uh, transportation. <clears throat> uh, also, one of the consequences on the action of the Russian Federation regarding the uh, disruption of the maritime transporting of Ukraine was a, a decrease in the volume of grain export by Ukraine, which led uh, to an increase in food price in the world. As a result, <coughs> the Russian-Ukrainian war increased the risk uh, significant uh, increase uh, the number of people who are uh, undernourished in the Asia Pacific region, Africa and the Middle East. <coughs> Uh, this uh, situation changed uh, in the summer of uh, 2022 after the successful uh, employment by the different forces of Ukraine of the available weapons, uh, uh, the enemy refused <coughs> to conduct active operation in the Black Sea. <coughs> this allowed uh, the defense forces of Ukraine to liberate the Zmini island uh, and uh, at the end of June uh, 2022 and create condition, uh, conditions for the activation of uh, shipping in the area on the Danube. <clears throat> However, the capacity of the Romanian Sulin Canal allowed a limited number of vessels to pass at the same time. This led to a traffic jam near uh, the new delta with more than 100 vessels. <coughs> the liberation of the Zmini island from the Russia troops uh, made it possible to use the Bistri mouse. However, this still uh, did not allow Ukraine to export the required amount uh, of grain. Uh, first of all, this is due to the fact uh, that the depth of the most uh, does not allow uh, large dry cargo vessels uh, to move through it. Through it. Is additional, the infrastructure of Ukrainian ports on the Danube uh, is insufficient capacity. For this, uh, it was necessary to resolve the issue of unblocking Ukrainian ports to resume grain export. <clears throat> this work was activated uh, at the beginning on July last year. As a result, on, on July tw <clears throat> uh, 22, uh, Ukraine, Turkey and the United Nations signed the agreement on grain export in Istanbul. The document is entitled uh, Initiative on the Safe Transportation of Grain and Foodstuff from Ukrainian Ports. <coughs> uh, the practical result of the agreement uh, reached uh, on July 22, uh, which the support of Turkey and the United Nations was the unblocking of Odessa, Chernomorsk and Sudeni ports and the start of the export of Ukrainian agriculture products. Uh, almost immediately after the signing of the grain uh, agreement, uh, Russia began to carry out hybrid action to disrupt uh, the functioning uh, of the grain corridors. 
Thus, thus since September 2022, the leadership of Russia falsely declares that Ukraine violates uh, the agreement of the Grain Initiative. Uh, for example, Russia President Vladimir Putin, speaking at the Eastern Economic Forum uh, on September uh, last year, accused uh, Ukraine and the West of the uh, violating agreement on unblocking Ukrainian sports for the export of grain. He said uh, then almost all uh, grain from Ukraine goes uh, not to the poorest country, but to the European Union. Be because uh, of this, according to Putin, Moscow will have to think uh, about uh, changing the routes uh, for Ukrainian grain exports. Uh, Putin also blamed the explosion of the Crimean bridge uh, on October of the last uh, year of Ukraine. He stated uh, that the explosive uh, could have been delivered to the Crimean bridge by vessels moving along the Grain Corridor. Uh, he also uh, threatened uh, to withdraw from the Grain Agreements. Uh, since, since October 2022, Russia has been sabotaging the inspection of uh, ship in the Bosphorus as part on the Black Sea Grain Initiative, resulting in a consistently large uh, cure of more than uh, 100 ships. <coughs> uh, this figure, figure shows the trends in the number of uh, ships that have arrived uh, at the ports through the Grain Initiative per month and uh, on average uh, per day in September uh, to December uh, 2022. This is the result of the actions uh, Russian inspectors of the uh, Joint Coordination Center regarding the delay in the inspection of the ship. Thus, the reduction from uh, six to uh, three in the number of vessels uh, that uh, depart delay through the Grain Corridor from the Bosporus Strait is a policy of Russia which cannot be happy about the successful export of Ukrainian grain. However, blocking of the grain corridor remains uh, uh, in integral part of Putin's plan for the new stage of the war on a treaty uh, against Ukraine. Uh, thus, in the event of the new uh, offensive by Russia, which is expected uh, in the new future, it's highly probably uh, that the Grand Corridor may be blocked. In general, hybrid action against uh, maritime uh, communication uh, of Ukraine uh, are aimed uh, and limiting the supply of Ukrainian grain uh, to the world market. The Russia Federation is trying to increase uh, the level of the inflation in European countries, uh, which according to forecast uh, of Russia analysts uh, will uh, lead uh, to social protest of the population, demanding a review of the policy regarding Russia's uh, special military operation uh, and the Russia Federation as a whole. Uh, they conducted uh, analysis of the condition of the situation on the <coughs> which Russia carried out operation against the maritime communications of Ukraine, allowed to determine the factors that uh, contributed uh, to it, its actions and the factors that negatively affect uh, these actions. The factors uh, uh, that 
yes. So, uh, conclusions. Uh, Russian operations against maritime communications of Ukraine began after the occupations and subsequent this annexation of the Crimea in 2014 and had a hybrid nature. The intensity of Russia actions against Ukrainian maritime communications uh, constantly increased from a minor uh, hybrid impact in 2014 to the blocking of Ukrainian seaports and vessels routes in 2022. Uh, the, the resumption of the navigation of uh, ship ex export, exporting agriculture products from the port of Ukraine in the summer of uh, 2022 became possible due to the uh, successful action of the defense forces of Ukraine at sea, in particular the naval forces. In the case uh, of the impossibility of the blocking maritime communication of Ukraine by military means, Russia carried out uh, hybrid actions. Uh, and the last, in order to uh, co counteract uh, hybrid action on economic activity at sea, it is necessary to apply political and diplomatic measures. Uh, the tool, uh, thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a short question. At this stage, I would have just a small question. Have you been able to compensate uh, the export of grain by land transport? Do you have any percent uh, amount that uh, has been transported by land due to not be able to transport by sea? Did you hear the question, Eviani? Uh, say again, please. So, do you know the percentage of uh, land transport for grain? Have you been able to compensate the loss of sea transport by land, by trucks or, or trains? Do you know? Uh, next speaker, who is uh, Stepan Yakimiak, uh, PhD, Captain Navy. He is an associate professor and uh, the chief of Naval Forces Department at the National Defense University of Ukraine. He has worked as an advisor to the commander of uh, Maritime Task Force of the Defense Forces of Ukraine. He uh, holds experience also working as a member of working groups on development of uh, maritime doctrine of Ukraine, doctrine of naval forces, of armed forces of Ukraine, and uh, maritime security strategy of uh, Ukraine. Honor to have you here, Stepan, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, one moment. Yes. One moment, please. Okay. Mm 
one moment. But you have to make sure you have to make sure you have to One moment, please. And, 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 and. Okay. Okay. And. Uh, share. This. Can you see? Uh, And, and uh, can you see myself? Okay. Uh, thanks. Dear colleagues, uh, I am Captain Navy Stefani Kimiak, Chief of Naval Forces Department of National Defense University of Ukraine. Uh, my topic uh, is Russian strategy and operational art in the war against Ukraine at sea, main lessons, learned trends and prospects. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope my experience and uh, as an advisor uh, to commander in chief Na Naval uh, task forces of Ukraine on Black Sea from uh, 24 uh, February to uh, 29 May, May uh, 2022 help us to understand situation and discuss about, about war sea. Uh, for good understanding and uh, And uh, for good understanding about preconditions and combat actions you see during Russian Ukrainian war, we must to answer uh, to such questions. How successful was the deterrence of Russia from expansion of aggression at sea? And uh, next question, is it objective to confirm that Russia was, was not able to succeed in uh, implementing its own strategy of limited actions uh, and its narrow strategy was a failure? And uh, what are the main conclusions and lessons from conducting warfare at sea and what determines the prospects for development of the situation at sea and the direction of joint contraction to aggress. Um, as you know, the Russian Federation began armed aggression in 20th of uh, February 2014. Uh, before this, the Russian Russia was conducted some special measures to decrease Ukrainian economic and military potential. Uh, my friend, my colleague, Evgeny Davidsky uh, uh, told about this. Um, from uh, 20th uh, of February, uh, 2014, uh, Russia conducted hybrid actions uh, main of which were, uh, were. and uh, main uh, of these actions uh, you can see on the slide. Information actions, uh, diplomatic phase, information and misinformation. Uh, the employment of military information without identification marks during occupation of, uh, of Crimea. Uh, and others, and others. Uh, as a result, the Russian Federation had a negative impact 
on the secu uh, security situation in Black Sea region. Uh, using technologies of hybrid, uh, hybrid influence and violating international law, in 1991-2014, uh, the Russian Federation destabilized the situation and seized large parts of territories and water spaces of three states of the Black Sea. First of all, Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, actions carried out by the Russian Federation against the specified states led to large-scale violation of human rights and humanitarian disasters in the occupied controlled territories. And after seizing all the uh, water spaces of Ukraine and Georgia, the Russian Federation, as you know, illegally uses the maritime resources of the Black and Azov Seas and negatively affects the maritime economic activity of states, in particular Ukraine. Hybrid, hybrid actions at sea, uh, delays, delays of civilian ships and large-scale closure of areas, for sailing, the Russian Federation negatively affects international shipping and maritime safety in general. Uh, as a result uh, of analysis, Russian hybrid actions in Ukraine, uh, we can conclude that uh, Gerasimov's strategy of limited actions did not succeed. On the slide, uh, we can see uh, the process of transferring from hybrid action to large scale invasion. Uh, and uh, uh, as a conclusion, uh, if the strategic goal of hybrid warfare is not achieved, the aggressor move to full-scale military actions. And we uh, uh, can see this point in the slide, uh, in the slide. On the next slide, number six, uh, we can see uh, the ratio of forces at sea on 24th of February 2022. Surface forces, first of all, warships 1, 2, 2, and total ships and uh, vessels 1, 2, 1 1.5. And the general ratio was 1 to 12. At the beginning of the war at sea, the main Russian purposes was in the Black Sea, ensuring dominance uh, commanded sea in the northern part of the Black Sea, blocking the Ukrainian naval forces and supports creation of, of for, for, uh, favorable conditions for expansion of aggression and attack on Ukraine from the sea directions by amphibious operations. And using the sea areas and air zones above them for missiles and air drones launched for important objects on the territory of all regions of Ukraine. In the Sea of Azov, uh, main Russian purposes was assistance to the troops during the capture of Berdyansk and Mariupol and carrying out sea lines of communication for interests of military operation on land and export operations. From uh, 24th of February, uh, the main Russian combat actions at sea were uh, for the first, uh, 24 hours by seven days, ensuring a constant presence in the northwestern part of Black Sea, maneuvering 
ships near coast and provoking our forces to open fire. Uh, next, transportation and disembarkation of sabotage and reconnaissance groups to our coast. Every night, conducting uh, reconnaissance by ships, manned aircraft and unmanned air aerial vehicles in the sea and over the sea. Over the coast, demonstration actions by uh, of Soviet forces, uh, carrying out selective strikes by ships and aircraft on military and civilian objects, and caliber class missiles launches from uh, surface ships and submarines for the strikes on objects on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, today uh, we can say that main stages of war at sea after 24th of February war, uh, war. The first stage uh, capturing and using command at sea by enemy the initial period of action uh, it was strong uh, period uh, we had no uh, some information uh, about where is enemy now uh, and what enemy will do next day uh, but uh, during March of uh, 2022 uh, we we has some uh, we have uh, we uh, made some uh, steps for good information uh, and second stage uh, as you know uh, disruption of enemy's command at sea and departure of his forces to the coast of crimea uh, after two uh, attack uh, attacks missiles attacks uh, missiles attacks Fil uh, the next stage actions of naval forces after implementing hybrid with agreements between the united nations ukraine and russia on the export of grain by sea and uh, fourth stage uh, from 29 of october to present time the enemy loses control the control of the, the of over the waters in area where his forces are based Uh, the main combat episodes uh, during war at sea were uh, missiles attack uh, uh, attacks on uh, guided missile frigates Essen and guided cruiser Moskva. As you remember, uh, some days before second uh, of second of April, Russian Federa Federation announced humanitarian corridor for uh, all merchant vessels which were in Ukraine, in Ukrainian ports. And um, at uh, around 10 o'clock on 2nd of April, we understood that uh, Friga Dessen will uh, use his usual way through this corridor. And uh, we recommended to our commander, commander of Naval Task Forces of Ukraine, that uh, we knew frigate way and we can to attack frigate, uh, uh, to attack frigate, uh, attack uh, after that uh, on uh, 12 uh, o'clock uh, we attacked this ship and frigate went to Sevastopol and did not return for 10 days the enemy 
the enemy ships no longer uh, entered the zone closer uh, than 80 kilometers from coast. Uh, on uh, 4th of April, we conducted uh, first hunting on uh, guided cruiser Moskva. Uh, cruiser, uh, but uh, in this day, cruiser went behind gas platform and we, uh, after that, we conducted analysis. Uh, what happened? Uh, why cruiser uh, went behind gas platform? And uh, after that, we conducted analysis and modeling next actions of cruiser. On April uh, 13th, we attacked cruiser next time with two uh, missiles of uh, cost missiles complex Neptune. Uh, uh, I think you know result result of this attack. Uh, cruiser was destroying and uh, go to battle. Uh, in this slide, we can see uh, transferring a line uh, 80 kilometers from our Ukrainian coast. And after attack of uh, guided missile cruiser, uh, guided missile cruiser Moskva, uh, next line. Uh, this line uh, is uh, near uh, is uh, ten or more kilometers from the uh, coast of Crimea. <clears throat> On the slide, we can see main consequences from uh, destructions of uh, missile cruiser Moskva. Operational consequences and strategic. Uh, for me, is very important strategic consequences. The enemy's refusal to use most of the area of military operation and in fact, the disruption of enemy's uh, commanded sea. Uh, and uh, we can see a uh, uh, significant negative impact on the moral and psychological state of population and military political leadership of Russia. This, uh, the, uh, the square of area uh, where uh, enemy uh, can uh, patrolling, maneuvering from uh, 24th of February to 13th of April uh, decrease from 89 persons to nine persons. On the slide, we can see main losses uh, of enemy ships. Uh, I think you know about it. Uh, and uh, the situation, operational situation uh, at sea in the uh, north, uh, western, western part of Black Sea was changed uh, on uh, 22 July of 2022. And uh, as you know, uh, it was after uh, signing of agreements, grain, uh, of grain uh, in it initiatives. Uh, main conclusions and lessons learned from experience of maritime actions in sea. The successful conduct of combat action by the Ukrainian Elders forces in the northern part of Black Sea disrupted the enemy's command at sea and limited, uh, limited the areas, areas of combat maneuvering of his strike forces near the coast of Crimea. Uh, second point, the effective organization of the defense of sea coast 
in particular uh, with the creation and use of mined missile air terrorist positions disrupted the enemy's amphibious operation and his strategic attack to Ukraine from the sea. Uh, and uh, the lack of long-range web long-range weapons in Ukraine forces does not allow to preventively destroy the enemy's cruise missile carriers and significantly reduce its negative impact on the general military strategic and operational situation. Some words about the future. Uh, the main uh, factors uh, that uh, excuse me, uh, effects effect on prospects of for warfare at sea uh, are uh, lack of sufficient capabilities to net neutralize enemy ships and submarines armed with long range ship based cruise missiles. The nature and results of actions on land, in particular in Crimea, and restoration of access to Sea of Azov. Uh, next factor uh, is the constant need to provide forces with uh, weapons and other material means to improve the balance of forces at sea. And uh, next, the scale and forms of international security and defense cooperation and understanding of need to transition to international or coalition level operation to compel Russia to peace and restore the ter territorial integrity of Ukraine and other states. Um, on the basis uh, of analysis, which was conducted Ukrainian by Ukrainian experts, uh, future uh, Russian uh, strategy at sea depends on general situation in uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, war, in particular on the land. Uh, if we understand uh, well, the main purpose of Russian forces at sea uh, will be assistance to the troops for conducting defense uh, in the coastal and riverine, uh, riverine uh, areas of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk regions, and preventing the loss of Crimea. And the second purpose uh, is ensuring the sea evacuation of troops and material resources from the Crimea to the ports in the eastern part of Black Sea. I uh, am finishing my uh, presentation and ready to answer your questions. Uh, my English level is not good, but uh, um, I, I will try to answer your question. Thank you. Do we have a question in the classroom for Stepan? I would like to know, Stepan, knowing that you have a background in uh, mine warfare also, so what has been the role of uh, mine warfare in this uh, war from the Ukrainian side and, and then also from the Russian side? Uh, if I understand well, <clears throat> some words about mine warfare, I see. Uh, yes, uh, before the 24th of uh, February, uh, we prepared uh, we prepared two enemy sections, uh, and uh, we uh, made some mine lane operations uh, for uh, anti-amphibious anti defense of our coast. Uh, uh, as uh, if I remember good, uh, in 25th of uh, February, uh, we, uh, uh, Ukraine announced uh, uh, that uh, in northwestern parts of Black Sea uh, um, are seven uh, special areas restricted uh, to 
плавания. Uh, to shipping, to shipping, to navigation. Uh, and uh, uh, every day after 24th of February, enemy uh, uh, tried uh, to it called it to went to our coast, uh, but uh, enemy knew that some uh, mine lines are in this area, and uh, uh, if you know, uh, as you know, uh, during uh, March, uh, April, next month, and uh, during this May, winter. January, February, uh, we had many, many uh, cases, uh, cases uh, uh, that mines, uh, uh, from anchors and go to surface of, of sea, and we Yes, and we provided uh, some special operation to destroy uh, to destroy these mines. And uh, but uh, now enemy uh, conducted some special operations. Uh, but uh, during uh, operation in Crimea in uh, 2014, uh, some our mines. Uh, were captured uh, by enemy. our enemy captured. kept kept uh, and we know it we, we, we knew it and uh, if we understand well of situation at sea now enemy uh, uh, used used our minds in, from Sevastopol, and uh, maybe some mines from uh, mine lines near our coast uh, by uh, special forces operations and uh, trans, 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 transferred these mines to territorial waters of Bulgaria, to Bosphor Strait, and for and to other areas, it was special uh, operations of uh, Russian uh, forces uh, in Black Sea. Yeah, a, it is my answer. Uh, I, I ready to to answer the next questions. Okay. Thank you. I think we'll save uh, the next questions to the panel session. But thank you. Captain, for your presentation. Next, we will have uh, Dr. Stephen Blank from the US as a speaker. He is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute Eurasia program. He has published over 900 articles and monographs on Soviet, Russian, US, Asian, and European military and foreign policies testified frequently before Congress on Russia, China, and Central Asia, consulted for the Central Intelligence Agency, major think tanks and foundations, chaired major international conferences in the US and in Florence, Prague, and London, and has been a commentator on foreign affairs in the media in the US and abroad. He has also advised major corporations on investing in Russia and is a consultant uh, for the Jason Lerman Group. Sir, it's an honor having you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm delighted to be able to make the presentation. I only wish I could be there physically. <clears throat> um, the paper I wrote discussing Russian naval operations looks at those operations not only in the Black Sea, but in... Are you, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, but not, on, not only in the Black Sea, but also 
globally, because if you look at the entirety of Russian naval operations, and not just those in the Black Sea, which my colleagues have very ably uh, described here, what we see is uh, something much broader in conception. Now, I'm going to be talking about naval operations, not Russian strategy as such. Uh, like Andrew Monahan, I don't believe the Russian uh, military or government has a specifically naval strategy, but rather that naval operations are subordinated to overall Russian strategy. And thus, when you look at these operations, you begin to realize uh, some of the dimensions of Russian strategy, even though this is not a paper about Russian strategy. Second, the uh, operations that take place say a great deal to us, not only about Russia's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and the Black Sea, but also vis-a-vis -vis Europe, NATO, and the United States. And they also involve the po possible use of nuclear or nuclear capable platforms in this strategy. At the same time, the results of the war to date and of the naval operations Russia has carried out also contribute to this uh, fact that as what we've seen of the failure or the level of incompetence, which has been surprising to many observers of the Russian military. And that has to be taken into account as well. So uh, this is a fairly wide ranging paper. Nevertheless, it's focuses on maritime operations. Now, initially, we know that Moscow expected a very short war. It expected to win in days. It had launched offensives all across Ukraine. And in this plan, the Navy, as, we can, as far as we can determine, had three explicit and one implicit mission. The explicit mission, as my colleagues have described it, was to blockade Ukraine in the Black Sea, cut off exports, cut off trade, and prevent the Ukrainian Navy from action. Second, it was to support the army by launching amphibious operations along the Ukrainian coast from Mariupol all the way up to Odessa, and to do so in tandem with the Russian army, which was expected to be advancing along this axis. Third, and this is a mission that has been outlined in the Russian maritime doctrine, it was to participate in launching uh, missiles and rockets against key targets inside Ukraine across the entire length and breadth of the country. This mission, we call it in English, SADSIT, Strategic Operations to Destroy Critical Infrastructure Targets. It's openly stated in the uh, 2017 Maritime Doctrine, which was the operating doctrine at the moment of the invasion, and is also uh, referred to again in the new doctrine that came out in July. So those were the three explicit missions of the military, of the Navy. The fourth implicit mission, although it's never stated, was critical. That is to deter NATO from getting into the Black Sea. And we may state that that has been the most successful of the missions to date. To various degrees, the three other missions have not completely succeeded. Oddly enough, the implicit mission of deterring NATO entry into the Black Sea has so far been relatively successful. Now, the reasons for these failures uh, are many. Uh, many of them have been discussed in the literature and, and the presumably in the sessions dealing with ground warfare, but we can single out two particular cases here which have become to light. One, recently, Alexander Goltz, the uh, very excellent Russian military commentator, published an article where he just pointed out that the Russian military and government have failed to establish any kind of viable joint central command linking together the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. As a result, 
uh, of that, they have been unable to synchronize operations. And as we know, amphibious operations are among the most difficult in all uh, militaries to bring off. Uh, the United States has had a distinguished record here because it has practiced those kinds of operations for years before undertaking them. And because it was able to devise, in this case, in, 19, in one case in World War II, a truly functional central command operation with the United Kingdom. So this allowed, for example, the D-Day operation and the other smaller amphibious operations in Europe to take place. The other great amphibious operation is, of course, Incheon in Korea, where MacArthur was in complete command, and therefore he was able to synchronize a land and uh, sea and air forces at that time. The Russians have still not figured out how to do this. And when you add to this the widespread understanding that it is difficult for the Russians still to conduct joint operations, and that includes operations on land involving air, uh, air land operations, uh, but certainly air sea and land sea operations, then it becomes clear why these amphibious operations were problematic from the start. And what's more, because Putin completely mischaracterized the war, the army failed to advance, and thus the amphibious operations uh, after a certain date were no longer feasible. A second failing, which has become obvious in the wake of the sinking of the Moskva, is poor seamanship. And this extends across the, uh, might say the entirety of naval warfare, but it is very clear that uh, Russian Navy does not function well in regard to these tasks of maintenance of logistics and so on. We've seen this in the army as well. And here again, this contributed to the loss, not only of the Moskva, but of 17 other ships to date. 18 Russian ships have been sunk. So here again, we see a problem that is not just naval in character, but pertains to the entire Russian military. The other two missions, the Sad Sit mission is going on, as we know. It's using land, air, and sea-based missiles. As a matter of fact, it is using any missile Russia can get its hands on, whether uh, Russian or foreign, to destroy Ukraine's critical infrastructure and it is truly pulverizing Ukraine. This mission is going on. However, because of the loss of the ships, particularly the Moskva and the Ukrainian capture of Snake Island, using the Astrov, the uh, Russian Navy has for the most part been forced to operate out of secure ports. Now there have been attacks by Ukraine on Sevastopol and other uh, home ports for the Russian Navy. Uh, they have not succeeded in destroying uh, the Navy's ability to carry out missile strikes, but they are limiting the Na Navy's ability to sail freely in the Black Sea. And that plus the capture of Snake Island and the opening of the Grain Corridor, no matter how problematic it is, as we have heard from the two previous excellent presentations, has to some degree weakened although not broken, the blockade. So here again, the blockade is only partially successful, I would argue. And th although the Russian Navy is still conducting the blockade and it is still affecting Ukraine, it is not nearly as stringent as would have been expected before the war. So the scorecard, if you like, for the Navy is mixed. It has deterred NATO, it has maintained, though at substantial cost and imperfectly, the blockade. Amphibious operations are no longer possible, although they may try to do them in the next offensive that is either underway or imminent. And the mission of striking Ukrainian infrastructure does continue, albeit from a greater distance than was probably earlier conceived. However, this is not the sum total of naval operations. 
If we look at Russian exercises leading up to the war involving the Navy, it becomes clear that this is not just a war against Ukraine. And this is a point that needs to be made in the West. Russian statesmen and spokesmen are now saying this, but they are fighting, quote, the collective West, and unquote. From the beginning, they were afraid of a European Western intervention, and they regard the war in Ukraine as part of the offensive against the West. In, in their minds, uh, thanks to what George Kennan calls a process of self-hypnosis, they have hypnotized themselves, excuse me, they have hypnotized themselves into believing that they were under an imminent threat from NATO. Thus, before the war, they surged the Russian Navy in many directions for exercises, particularly in the North Atlantic. And they deployed ships in the Irish Sea and the North Atlantic to places where they would have gone in what the Russians call the initial period of war to disrupt intercontinental communications between North America and Europe. They cut the Svalsat satellite communications, although they don't admit it, there's nobody else who has any motive for doing so. And they also deployed nuclear capable planes and ships within striking distance of both Europe and the United States and Canada. This suggests that the threat, if not the actual use of nuclear weapons in a first strike mode, and maybe not only tactical nuclear weapons, remains a real option in Russian overall Russian military strategy. Second, that they clearly thought there might be a Western and European response and were moving to preempt it, if you like, by these naval maneuvers in the North Atlantic and in the Arctic. And third, that the missions of striking enemy critical infrastructure were also being considered because of the deployment of dual capable missile bearing platforms in the oceans where they could strike either Europe or American targets. Interestingly enough, we see a similar phenomenon in the Mediterranean and Black Sea. Now, countless sources have pointed out that the Russian deployments into the Mediterranean, both historically and in the present, have as their core purpose protecting the Black Sea fleet and deterring Western entry into the Black Sea. In this sense, they are following a very czarist maxim by Catherine the Great, that the only way she had to, ex to defend her frontiers was to expand them. They are doing this in maritime terms as well. And the projection of military power into the Mediterranean and beyond into the Red Sea and so on, clearly aims not just to project Russian power in all of its manifestations globally, for example, the Middle East or now Africa. Power projection in Russia is also a deterrence mission. And that is one of the key points that I think key comes out of the paper and that we need to keep in mind as we study Russian naval operations as well as overall Russian strategy. That the power projection we see both in peacetime and in wartime is a deterrence maneuver among other things and that deterrence is critical the power projection. Furthermore, in the exercises that Russia was undertaking just before the war began, off the coast of Syria and in the Mediterranean, here again, we see the same pattern, dual capable or nuclear capable platforms exercising within range of NATO's Mediterranean uh, deployments in order to inform NATO as a form of information warfare, that any attempt to move into the Eastern Mediterranean or Black Sea 
would be met by force. And that mission succeeded. To this date, nobody has attempted to break the blockade or enter the, Rus the Black Sea. Now, the Black Sea blockade, as my colleagues have pointed out, continues. It's inflicting a lot of harm, not only on Ukraine, but on global grain trade uh, and other commodities as well. And it is illegal. It goes back to 2014, as they have pointed out. And more recently, in the blockade began 10 days before the actual onset of hostilities on February 24th. Now, because in international law, blockade is recognized as an act of war, Moscow really started the war on February 10th, not February 24th. Although formally, February 24th is the uh, date that is universally ascribed. Now, we know that blockade is an act of war going back many, many years in international law. Uh, the the Six-Day War of 1967 between Israel and the, Met and the Arab states uh, was triggered by the Egyptian, among other things, the mobilization of the Egyptian army, and mobilization is an act of war, and the blockade of the Straits of Tehran, which Egyptian diplomats said was undertaken because at that time we were in a state of war with Israel. Well, the same thing applies here. Moscow was in a state of war with Ukraine, even though it had not declared one. It was un undertaking acts of war before the actual onset of hostilities and declaration of war. And that makes the blockade in many, many ways an absolutely illegal blockade and suggests that we ought to give more thought not only to implementing the uh, American legislation on lend-lease with Ukraine that was signed last fall, but also on ways of, of breaking the blockade in order to relieve the pressure, ec the economic pressure on Ukraine and on global exports. So the, the conclusion of the paper points out, one, operations, <clears throat> excuse me, operations in the uh, naval sphere were not restricted to the Black Sea. Instead, they embrace, to some degree, the Eastern Mediterranean and the North Atlantic and even Arctic. They involve the threat of first strike nuclear weapons, as well as the SADSIT mission uh, targeting NATO members, including the United States and all of Europe. Third, that the Russian command problems apparently have still not been sorted out and there's no sign forth that the uh, seamanship issue has been successfully addressed either. That means that the, what we see in the Navy is of a piece with what we see in the Russian army. Uh, a great deal of force brutally expended for results that are suboptimal, but that are nevertheless global in their repercussions and ramifications, and which we therefore need to do a better job of addressing. Thank you. Uh, time for applause for all the uh, presentations that we have had. <laughs> OK, thank you, Stephen. You caught up our uh, late timetable and, and we're a few minutes early even. At this stage I think uh, it's time to have a short panel uh, session. I hope we have also questions from, from our side here. But uh, listening to these free presentations and uh, thinking of what we heard uh, during this uh, morning's sessions, I must say that uh, hybrid operations are extremely effective uh, against the sea lines of communications and, and uh, building up a sea blockade because uh, mainly hybrid operations uh, were able to, to build up this blockade. Of course, there was kinetic uh, power used also, but, but mainly, as you said, that uh, the war started already on the 10th and that was when when the uh, first uh, areas uh, denied from uh, navigation were, were issued. So hybrid warfare is, is strongly in naval warfare. 
present at this time. Um, first question that I would like to, to present, I think, to all of you uh, speakers is uh, in the war, Russia's war against uh, Ukraine, so we have seen uh, unmanned uh, systems being extremely effective and even in no, uh, naval warfare uh, we have seen uh, unmanned uh, systems uh, hitting hitting uh, smaller fast boats, raptors, auxiliary ships, and then we have had also the uh, uh, unmanned uh, vessels uh, hitting Sevastopol. And uh, it has seemed that at least in the start of the war, Russia didn't have means to defend itself against these. Are they still as effective as at this stage? Has Russia learned to, to defend against these? Or are unmanned systems the, the new normal in, in modern naval warfare? Is that something that, uh, that all the countries uh, should be looking into? And question, open for answers, who, who would like to? Uh, let me try to give an answer. My colleagues who are professionals may be able to support or advance different op uh, opinions here. I think based on this war, not this war alone either, I think it's clear to say that uh, the, uh, the future belongs to unmanned uh, vehicles. That does not mean that we can't come up with defenses. I mean, defenses have been found in many cases, uh, certainly on land. Uh, and apparently the Russians were able to uh, deflect an unmanned uh, missile attack on uh, Sevastopol a couple of weeks ago. But I think for reasons of economy, accuracy, and, technolog and technological ease of acquisition, that uh, UAVs are going to be not just on, on sea, but uh, land as well, uh, choice instruments of warfare. They're not going to be the only uh, instruments, uh, but they do offer great advantages. They are, in a sense, the materialization, or at least one materialization, of the view of uh, you know, the famous General Orgarkov, who talked about reconnaissance fire complexes and reconnaissance strike complexes. This is, uh, the, the UAVs are weapons that can both see and strike at the same time, well, or in real time. And uh, they can also be linked of course, the headquarters, which can then launch missile strikes from air, sea, or ground as well. So uh, they facilitate not just uh, reconnaissance strike complexes, but also interdomain activity on a grand scale. So, and they're cheap, and they don't risk manpower. And the uh, technology behind them, although it's modern, is not that difficult to acquire. I mean, I, I can give you an example. 10 years ago when I, uh, I had a student write a paper and he was talking about the use of what we called then uh, drones, UAVs in Africa, in many of the local wars that were taking place in Africa. This got no publicity. Nobody was writing about this, but he found all these sources and displayed it. And that was 10 years ago. So since then, given the sophistication of the newer models and the diffusion of this technology to what really are third world countries, North, I mean, uh, Iran, for example, uh, North Korea is now building drones and so on. I do think that the answer to your question is yes. Uh, even though there are defenses, they are in real sense, uh, a major part of the, uh, not just the present, but the future of war. Does uh, Yevgeny or Stepan have something to, to add to this? Uh, like, uh, can you have some, uh, some uh, ideas and uh, uh, approaches to understand the situation uh, at sea? Uh, in context, in, in context of uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, uh, as you know, uh, on 
10th of February uh, this year uh, was uh, a new case of uh, employment of uh, unmanned uh, surface vehicle uh, near uh, small city village Zatoka. Uh, on the bridge, uh, bridge, this bridge, uh, Ukraine using for uh, export operation uh, by by train. Uh, but uh, uh, this information is only in open sources. And uh, we now we have not some special and detailed information about this. But uh, in generally, in generally, uh, after the 29th of October uh, 2022, for me. For my understanding, uh, warfare at sea, warfare at sea uh, in the Russian-Ukrainian war, and uh, warfare at sea uh, in, in global context, uh, we had some uh, uh, revolution in military affairs. Uh, but uh, if uh, we understand well, uh, uh, we uh, we could saw uh, complex employment uh, aerial unmanned vehicles and uh, surface unmanned vehicles uh, and. Uh, main conclusions of this situation or this uh, changes in operational uh, situation at sea uh, is uh, is uh, all of navies of all camp countries don't ready to defense from attack of uh, a complex attack of uh, aerial uh, aerial uh, surface subsurface unmanned vehicles uh, russia russian fleet black sea fleet uh, did not ready uh, route did not Ready? Good, not ready to eat. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, any uh, of uh, fleets of navies, uh, foreign countries, uh, Black Sea countries, uh, NATO countries. Uh, don't ready to defense uh, against these vehicles. It's my opinion, uh, and uh, my more main argumentations uh, are: uh, first of all, uh, navies don't have special system to detect this uh, small uh, vehicles, uh, in particular uh, surface and subsurface vehicles. We understand that uh, the, the big, big size of uh, more largest size of vehicles, uh, surface vehicles on the, on the surface uh, is uh, 50 centimeters and uh, we don't have uh, some special uh, detectors uh, means 
to detect uh, these uh, targets on the sea. And uh, unmanned subsurface vehicles, uh, I am a, mi a miner. Uh, uh, in my uh, career uh, I, uh, background. background, and I understand uh, uh, how how uh, how difficult to detect mine in the water. Mine uh, size uh, one meter or more. Uh, and uh, subsurface vehicle uh, has have speed 20 or more, maybe to 50 knots uh, uh, in water. And we understand it's a difficult task for navies, uh, today navies. Thanks. Thank you for your answer. Do we have any questions in uh, the classroom? Please. Can you come up here? I think it's... Thank you. I think this microphone is the one. This one here? This one. Oh. question uh, for our uh, friends uh, for Mr. Stephen Blank uh, about your op opinion uh, what will be in the future uh, on uh, Black Sea Azov Sea uh, we understand that uh, this situation uh, defend Depends, uh, depends, depends depend on the operations uh, on land. But uh, for me, it's very interesting uh, opinion our colleague, colleagues about uh, future situation. Uh, your opinion, please. Okay. Um... Well, uh, I, I don't think they'll be able to do amphibious operations first, because again, I don't see that the Russian army is able to advance to support uh, them. And apart from the problems, which you understand as a professional about coordinating land, sea and air, uh, I don't think that's likely. I think the blockade will continue unless the West provides much more uh, naval assistance to Ukraine or actually is able to, uh, and willing to, to break it. Of course, that means Erdogan has to let ships into, uh, uh, naval ships into the Black Sea. Further, they will continue to use naval platforms to shell Ukrainian targets all over Ukraine, uh, as I've described. So I think that what the foreseeable future of operations in the Black Sea depends, first of all, on the uh, course of battle on the land, and second, on the willingness of NATO. Uh, and I have, uh, if you follow what I've written, I've been very critical of this to do more uh, to do more for Ukraine. I think, for example, that because the blockade is illegal, we should have gone and we should go to the United Nations, obtain a resolution of support in the General Assembly to break the blockade. This is how we fought the Korean War in 1950. Uh, and uh, just as the blockade is illegal, so was that war. Uh, I also think we ought to be giving Ukraine more anti-ship capabilities so that they can, Ukraine can take out more of the Russian Navy. And uh, I further believe that we have been waiting too long to give you tanks, those are coming, air defense, those are now coming, and airplanes. Um, in, as you well know, uh, in contemporary naval war, uh, superiority 
at sea cannot be obtained unless you have at least some control of the air. Uh, and since the Russian Air Force is not able to achieve air supremacy, if the Ukrainian Air Force is able to challenge it effectively, that will degrade Russian capabilities at sea as well as at land. And that will, I think, materially change the situation in the Black Sea. Okay? Uh, thank you. I, I agree with you. And uh, uh, for the first, most important is uh, supremacy and command in air. Uh, from uh, March of 2022, every day every day and every night two uh, uh, fighter aircraft russian of uh, russian forces uh, on the air on duty on the air to for reconnaissance and uh, for destroying our uh, surface surface ships mm -hmm. uh, boats and others and um, uh, yes, uh, if uh, our uh, air forces, air forces of Ukraine, uh, will be able to and has capabilities, has capabilities for uh, fighting in air, uh, the situation uh, will be changed, uh, um, and. Uh, but. Um, my idea, in addition to your opinions, uh, modern armaments, uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, maybe, uh, will play uh, main, not maybe main, uh, very important role. Uh, but our president, our uh, president of Ukraine uh, said, we uh, must have uh, to 100 drones, uh, mar maritime drones, uh, maritime robotic systems, uh, complexes. And uh, now uh, this project uh, is develop developing. Uh, 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 I, I don't uh, can uh, say some uh, some special information for this, but I know uh, Ukrainian Navy uh, uh, prepare uh, is preparing surprise to our enemy in this field uh, and uh, we will see. We will see in the future uh, what uh, about uh, the role of unmanned vehicles uh, for me uh, will be the same in, in grow. It will grow, grow. Good as a start. You grow. Will grow. Will you grow. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question here in the room. Hello, this is Mark DeVore from the University of St. Andrews. Uh, I hope your surprise goes very well. Uh, I basically have two questions that are very much in line with the discussion you just had. The first question is, what forms of Western assistance or training would be most useful in helping Ukraine at this stage do more in the maritime sphere and reclaim more maritime yeah, more control of the Black Sea. The second question is somewhat related, and that is, given the discussion we've had of hybrid and other types and gray zone types of operations, are there ways that NATO or Ukraine's other allies can help with hybrid and gray zone operations? Is this the occasion to do some freedom of navigation uh, exercises off the Russian Arctic uh, Ocean uh, shores? Is this a good occasion? Are there ways that we can harass uh, Russian 
uh, petroleum exports out of Novo Rusisk. Yeah, so basically what can be done to help Ukraine either in terms of weaponry or in terms of hybrid gray zone support. Uh, I'll start. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, let me let me let me try to answer those questions, Mark. Um, first of all, I, I said some of this in my answer, but let me repeat it. Um, I mean, you know, ideally it would be nice for Ukraine to get a lot of ships. That's not going to happen because just it takes too long to build them and get them there. But what needs to happen in the maritime sphere uh, is that Ukraine and its allies need to generate more UAVs that are capable of striking Russian maritime and air targets. So to, to make the uh, blockade uh, inoperable and to deprive them of the ability to use those naval platforms as strike platforms against Ukraine's infrastructure. Second, I said it before, we, need, we should have been giving Ukraine planes before. I just published an article. I mean, the, Rus the Soviets gave, flew missions in 1950 in Korea. They gave planes to Vietnam. Uh, they gave planes and flew missions in, in Egypt in 69. I, and, they never, and they didn't think this was going to force the US to escalate. I don't see why we're so afraid of that, uh, or NATO is. I, I, and I think we need to overcome that and give Ukraine uh, planes that will, you know, for, both for use on ground, in ground scenarios, which we won't discuss, but also for uh, relevant to maritime operations. Third, uh, the United States now has the law on the books of the Lend-Lease. If you remember how Lend-Lease operated in World War II, and there's an abundant literature on this, basically we gave the great, the British and then the Russians ships or supplies in return for British naval bases. And we were shipping billions of dollars in current terms of weapons and, and, and food to Russia, which helped the Soviets fight the war. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that again in return for which we would get ships anchored at Ukrainian ports and the Russians will not attack an American ship. I think that's clear to all of us. Third, as I said, the, in the maritime sphere, the UN, if somebody with General Assembly, if the UN General Assembly was approached uh, in order to open the resolution saying that the blockade, not to, not to mention the entire war, is illegal and we're going to organize a UN commanded force led by the United States or NATO to break the blockade uh, and you could get Erdogan to go along with this, you have to buy him off to be frank, but uh, it, it might be possible. Then you could do a great deal to terminate the, uh, Russia's ability to wage maritime warfare against Ukraine. Now, the second point about hybrid, you know, uh, whether we call it hybrid or not, we've been watching this for years and it's, this is all, uh, and I say this as a historian of the Soviet Union, Soviet tactics. These are not new tactics, they're new technology so you can do them on a greater scale. But the point is we have to be ready to act. I mean, I know from my own experience here in Washington, I said 10 years ago that if the, Europe, that if the Ukrainian government signed the U association agreement with the European Union, Moscow would invade, that they, they, the Ukrainians told me I was right. That's why Yanukovych wouldn't do it, that he was so threatened. And when the Yanukovych government collapsed, it was clear that the Russians, uh, a fortiori, were going to invade Crimea. And the Obama administration had people who knew this, and they still didn't do anything. Uh, Germany and France didn't do anything. They kept buying even more Russian energy and so on. So the point is that Europe and the United States must come to an understanding that they have been under attack. And my sources will show that it goes back to 2005 by Russia. And that they have to assume that they are at war with Russia, even if it's not kinetic and uh, formal declaration, and retaliate in kind. Sanctions are one example, but also uh, to prevent hybrid war. Information warfare has to be improved, defense against Russian strikes, strikes against Russian information and cyber targets in, and information warfare against Russia, and 
to clean up uh, our own governance, uh, get rid of the corruption, get rid of Russian money, and uh, uh, overcome Russian tactics because Russia is waging a war on all fronts, and we just need to. Un and we, the beginning of wisdom here is to understand that we're under attack. One from the uh, Ukrainian side want to add to this answer? Uh, if I understand uh, well, uh, questions. Uh, first question. Uh, some words about assistance uh, of uh, foreign countries, uh, NATO countries and others uh, to Ukraine uh, in our war against, uh, against Russia. Uh, and uh, the preparation uh, of our, uh, our personal uh, in Ukraine or in uh, Western countries, uh, in, U in U Europe countries, uh, in Europe countries. Uh, as you know, and uh, I think uh, you understand that this assistance is very, very important for us. Uh, and every day uh, we said thank you, our partners. But uh, yes, we have a uh, cost missile complex Neptune, but uh, range uh, of uh, launches, missiles launches uh, of this complex uh, is two, uh, three, three hundred kilometers. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for our foreign partners for. Uh, United States and uh, Dania, Denmark. Uh, we received uh, harpoons, missiles, uh, anti surface complex. And uh, now we uh, used this complex. Uh, but now, in uh, today, we have not some special means to uh, uh, for long distance uh, missiles attack uh, to enemies warships russians warships uh, at sea uh, near crimea near novorossiysk uh, uh, now uh, we want to have uh, armaments, missiles, uh, missiles uh, by uh, warships, carriers uh, for long distance, longer, more longer, uh, 300 kilometers. And uh, it's a general problem for Ukraine. Uh, but uh, Russia every day and today in Kiev, in Ukraine, uh, we uh, have uh, Russian attack, attack, attacks from territory of Russian Federation, from uh, air, airplanes, fields, uh, 1,000 kilometers from Kiev and more. And uh, naval base Novorossiysk is a законно, law target, target for our attack, for our uh, strike, and uh, we must to destroy this naval base. Uh, yes, we have information, we see every day what enemy do in Novorossiysk, near Novorossiysk, in Azovsi, but we have not special means to destroy uh, enemy forces in uh, naval base, in, in this naval bases. Uh, and 
again, uh, we thanks very much for our partners. But uh, we hope uh, in the near future we uh, will have armaments for these tasks uh, for destroying uh, may, uh, enemy targets uh, in long distance, in long distance, uh, in uh, all areas of ar areas of Black Sea, and as all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, sir. I think uh, it's time to wrap up this uh, session. Thank you for uh, Stephen Blank. And uh, especially thank you for our Ukrainian friends. May you be victorious. Slava Ukraini. It was good to hear from you. And, uh, and uh, thank you for this session. We will call it a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.